Okay, good. Let's call the meeting to order. And if you'll rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. D, if you could uh, call the roll. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Yee. Present. Director Stewart. Present. Director Epen. Present. Director Wallace. Present. Great. Thank you, Dean. Could you tell us who is in the room with you? Uh, tonight in the room, we have Kimberly Hart, Ed Fayen, Chris Henry, Tina Nunez, <laughs> Stephanie Williams, Erica Luna, Paul Kozachenko, Shri Badu, and me, D'Antonio. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome to the June 9, 2021 regular meeting of the Washington Township Healthcare District Board of Directors to comply with Alameda County's Order 2101 as issued on January 25, 2021 to comply with social distancing measures and other restrictions necessary to control the spread of COVID-19, this meeting will be conducted by Zoom. I ask that you please mute your system until such time as you need to speak. Governor Newsom's executive order N-2920 explicitly waives the Brown Act provision that requires the physical presence of members, the clerk, or of the public as a condition of participation in or quorum for a public meeting. We continue to comply with the Brown Act in providing dial-in information in order to provide the public the opportunity to attend the meeting. Public notice for this meeting, including dial-in information, has been posted appropriately on our website. We are recording tonight's regular session of the board meeting. It will be posted on our website for future viewing. We'll now move to the communications portion of our agenda. Members of the public are invited to speak during oral communications. When prompted, please state your name for the record, then proceed with your statement not to exceed three minutes on issues or concerns not on the agenda and within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the board. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak at this meeting? Hearing none, D, do we have any written communications? No, we do not. Okay, great. We'll now move on to our consent calendar. The consent calendar consists of those agenda items that the board will approve with one motion, unless either a member of the board or a member of the public requests to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar. If any items are removed from the consent calendar, the board will take action on the removed agenda item later in the meeting under the action item heading of the agenda. Does anyone on the board want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, does any member of the public want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent calendar items A and B? Uh, yes, Mr. President, in accordance with district law policies and procedures, I move that the Board of Directors approve the consent calendar items A and B. Thank you. Do we have a second? No second. A second from Director Yee. Thank you, Dee. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Yee? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye, sorry. Director Epen? Aye. <clears throat> Director Wallace? Aye. Thank you. The uh, motion passes and the consent calendar is approved. So our uh, presentation tonight is our budget estimate for fiscal year 21, 2021 through 2022. And Kimberly, if you could uh, um, introduce Chris. Yes, I am 
I will start it off. So uh, this evening we are going to be presenting um, the fiscal year estimate of fiscal year 2022 to the Board of Directors. We have Chris Henry, our Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and we have Erica Luna, our Assistant Chief Financial Officer, um, who will be presenting tonight. And I do want to just make a, a few comments. I think that um, as we are all well aware, um, there does appear to be a stronger light shining at the end of the tunnel in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, I think we've seen uh, a lot of uh, the COVID-19 volume level up, decrease and level off uh, at the hospital. Um, but it has, the pandemic, I must say, has been one of the probably an unprecedented and, mo and the biggest challenge the healthcare system has faced um, in its history. I think, though, overall, um, we have done very well in terms of being able to care for our patients when they needed us the most. Um, so going forward for this, for this the next fiscal year, um, you know, there is still some degree of uncertainty, and I think we all know that, given just uh, knowing that COVID is not going to be going away completely, and we don't really know the true economic impact that uh, COVID will will have uh, going forward. So uh, once again, it is our, our best estimate as to where things stand for this next fiscal year based on what we know today. Um, so uh, Chris Henry is going to, to begin, and then I, Erica Luna, our assistant CFO, is going to follow. And I just want to remind the board in terms of her background um, and that, that Erica has day-to-day -day responsibility for day-to-day -day operations of the finance division, including direct oversight of financial planning and analysis and treasury. Erica earned a Bachelor of Science degree in finance from Cal State East Bay and has many years of experience in healthcare finance, including leadership roles with HDA hospitals and Verity Health Systems before joining the healthcare district in September 2018. So with that, I'm going to um, you know, go ahead and turn it over to Chris to begin. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, before we get started, uh, I need to say some thank yous to some folks. Um, first and foremost, Erica Luna. Erica really uh, uh, ran the show uh, this year during the budget season and uh, made sure everybody was getting the things done that they needed to get done and on time and, and ran numerous meetings and just put a lot of time and effort into it. So Erica, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I want to thank Dan Nardoni, who I think is with us virtually tonight. I think I saw him up there. Um, you know, Dan has been doing this for years and really provided a lot of support to both Erica and I um, as we kind of pass the torch uh, that Dan's been carrying for, for a number of years. Also, big thank yous to Nicole McMahon, uh, which is, and the entire financial planning and analysis staff, they really spent a lot of time um, pulling things together for us, as well as uh, the accounting staff who also supported us in getting this done. Need to thank Ed Fayen, Tina Nunes, and Stephanie Williams for their um, real uh, strong attention to this this year. We, we really pulled this together uh, much more smoothly than it's gone in the last couple of years. And it was a lot of that is due to the efforts of those three people. So Ed, Tina, and, and um, Stephanie, thank you so much. I want to say thank you to the entire hospital management team. Everybody has a piece of this. This is, and I say this every year and, it, and it's really true. This, this is everybody's budget. Everybody in the management team of the hospital has participated <laughs> in it and spent time and um, given thoughtful attention to their numbers. So I want to thank them. And finally, I want to thank Kimberly Hartz, whose strategic vision and commitment to this organization has really been the driving force on what you're about to see tonight. So Kimberly, thank you very much. So with that, um, I do want to say uh, that this is our mission statement, and um, the mis mission statement does drive everything we do here in this hospital, and um, I've said this before, I say this every year, uh, because I need to remind people that the budget really is the financial embodiment of this mission. It's the foundation that allows 
the caregivers and the other staff here at the hospital to move forward and provide the services that we provide to the community and fulfill this mission. And uh, what a ride it's been over these last 15 months in fulfilling that mission. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges to Washington Hospital and other hospitals, and we've learned a lot. Now that more people are becoming vaccinated and the state and federal governments appear ready to open up and eliminate many of the mandated COVID uh, restrictions, it's time to switch our focus from pandemic management to recovery, normalization of operations, and pursuing the growth of the healthcare system. As with all hospitals, as the year progresses, we'll be learning more about what our new normal will be. However, we feel well prepared to adapt and make changes quickly as the post-pandemic environment reveals itself. Federal, uh, the federal government responds. I'm sorry. Does somebody have a question? Okay. Um, the federal government response uh, to the COVID pandemic has been a mixed bag. Early on in the pandemic, the federal government was moved very quickly to provide financial support to hospitals that were struggling under the financial strain caused by the pandemic. Several funding programs brought quick relief to offset sudden and deep decreases in revenue and rapid increases in costs, including labor, uh, personal protective equipment, pharmaceuticals, lab supplies, uh, and equipment. Later efforts have been anemic at best, uh, with politics and bureaucratic confusion effectively, um, uh, effectively uh, stopping any kind of additional relief in fiscal year 2021, uh, despite severe nationwide spikes in the virus during uh, the fall and winter. CARES Act funding that was passed in March 2000 still has not been fully distributed. There's been no meaningful additional funding programs that have been provided in fiscal year 2021. Um, the conversion of payroll protection program loans that were provided early on uh, to grants are caught up in bureaucratic, bureaucratic red tape and there are no answers as to when our grant applications will be processed. The recruitment of the uh, Medicare advanced payments began in April 2021, and this is before hospitals have even had time to get their, uh, back on their, final, their financial feet. Um, and it's still unclear what the requirements will be to qualify for keeping the CARES Act funding we received in 2020 uh, uh, by the federal government. The rules are still not set. And again, you've seen this slide before, this is all happening at the same time as reimbursement from government programs continue to fall short of cost. In fiscal year 2021, we're projecting the shortfall from cost, and this is not from charges, this is from cost, the shortfall of government payment from cost at $158.8 million for fiscal 2021. That's up 4.4 million from fiscal year 2020, and this is despite the temporary suspension of the Medicare 2% sequestration payment reduction that was enacted in April of 2013 and enhanced payments for COVID-related services. At the state level, uh, things have been uh, also a mixed bag. And although the state has never provided direct financial support, they have been supported in, very, uh, in other ways. Um, early on, the distribution from PPP E from state stockpiles was critical to Washington Hospital. Um, also, early on, the distribution of COVID vaccines was, was wonderful, worked great for us. Uh, and the regulatory relief provided, um, such as the Brown Act provisions that Dr. Nicholson spoke about earlier tonight, uh, that allows this board to meet uh, virtually. Recent efforts, however, have been a little bit more burdensome and onerous. Um, COVID vaccine distribution, for instance, was subcontracted to Blue Shield, which required a whole nother level of documentation and a separate system to document in. It really um, it, it complicated a system that was already, from our standpoint, working well. Um, 
this year the state budget in, uh, created the Department of Healthcare Affordability. This is a, a, a group that is being put together by the state to uh, look at hospital pricing. Um, and word on the street is that their first request for um, uh, personnel is to hire 30 lawyers. So we, I think we know where that's going. Um, also, um, you know, AB 650, which re would have mandated additional pay. Fortunately, this was pulled off by um, the sponsor and the author of this bill, but that would have required additional pay during the COVID uh, pandemic that for Washington Hospital would have cost us about a million dollars a month retroactive to January and continuing until the national emergency is ended. Um, so again, actions at the state and federal level, you know, mixed bag of support and not so much support. From the county perspective, though, um, the county has been very supportive to us for the duration of the pandemic, providing PPE, vaccines, and most importantly, information throughout the pandemic, including direct access to the county health officer for um, hospital CEOs. And I know Kimberly felt, felt that was uh, really helpful. The economic environment um, as it is as expected. Unemployment spiked nationally uh, in April and May of 2020 and then slowly improved. Um, district unemployment, which is the green line here, ran lower than the national and state numbers for the most part. Um, Pre-COVID unemployment here in the district, and this is a number from February 2020, was at 2.8%. It peaked at 12.3% in April 2020 and was down to 5.4% just this last March. We have seen the impact of unemployment in our pair mix as Medi-Cal has crept up and hovered to close to 20% of gross revenue over the last 12 months. There are signs that the economy is improving um, as the rate of COVID infections drop. The National Jobs Report was issued just last Friday uh, and indicated these were for May indicated that national unemployment had dropped to about 5.8% from the peak of 14.7% back in April of 2020. Employers created 550,000, excuse me, 559,000 jobs in May. And while that's a strong number, uh, it came in well below analyst expectations. Unemployment remains well below pre-pandemic, excuse me, employment remains well below pre-pandemic levels. And interestingly, employers are reporting that they're having difficulty filling jobs, which uh, is kind of counterintuitive. What will happen over the next 12 months economically is uncertain, as Kimberly mentioned. The economy is expected to continue improving as vaccination rates increase and states set aside pandemic restrictions, but the pace of improvement is a subject of debate and some worry that an overheated economy, economy may spark inflation, but at this point, um, the federal government is downplaying that risk. So we have lived through a historic time these last 15 months. And as I said earlier, it's been a time that brought unprecedented challenges to Washington Hospital. Volume reduced significantly in fiscal year 2020 and stayed low for much of fiscal year 2021 although uh, volumes began to come back as COVID vaccination rates increased. Net patient revenue decreased by about $19.2 million in fiscal year 2020, but recovered in fiscal year 2021, uh, although still slightly lower than fiscal year 19. However, while volumes of net revenue dropped, expenses did not. In fact, they continued to increase uh, over the entire period. Uh, in fiscal year 2019, which was the pre-COVID year, last pre-COVID year, our operating expenses um, were uh, uh, about $465 million. In fiscal year 20, which is when we saw the largest drop in volume and uh, revenue, the uh, operating expenses increased 460 to $466 million. And our estimate for fiscal year 21 is that they will increase to 489 million. All of this has created tremendous strain on our bottom line, as you've seen uh, month to month this year. Um, 
It's unknown how much volatility we'll continue to see in regards to the COVID virus. The virus will likely continue to mutate. Uh, and while current vaccines seem to be effective against mutations thus far, it's unknown if this will continue into the future. Uh, so uh, as Kimberly had mentioned, that's really the uncertainty that we're dealing with um, both economically and in relation to the virus. I do want to point out, though, that even though we've had our challenges, um, we do continue to meet all of our bond covenants. And while days cash have dropped about on hand have dropped about 23 percent, we've been able to maintain a he healthy, albeit lower, level of cash reserves, and it really is, has gotten us through this pandemic. So far, we've weathered the storm relatively well. We've had a lot of help, and we are so grateful for the outpouring of support we have received from our community. Donations of money, food, PPE, cards and letters all helped us through this difficult time. The government's uh, program support we received in fiscal year 2020 was critical and really helped us get through the pandemic and we're thankful to have received it. We are especially proud of, our, of uh, the teamwork displayed by our hospital and medical staffs during the crisis. In a very short amount of time, they banded together to create new processes, protocols, and programs that allowed us to continue to serve our community while keeping our patients, staff, and physicians safe. And now it's time to move forward. Uh, these are our strategic priorities for, our, for the coming year. They're intended to stabilize and improve our current operations in a post-pandemic new, uh, new normal environment. Uh, where we will continue the work we had begun uh, before the pandemic to expand and improve existing key product lines, and we will lay the foundation for the growth of the healthcare system into the future. They include investments in staff, physicians, equipment, and construction that will allow us to continue to provide new services to all of the residents of our district and to provide a first-class experience for our patients. And this is what this budget provides for this year. And Erica will take you through the details of, of these. Total operating revenue of $505.3 million. Capital equipment, IT, and facility spending of $19.4 million. Funding of $9.6 million into our pension and post-retirement benefit plans. It provides for the debt service on our revenue and general, general obligation bonds. It targets EBITDA of $47.6 million, hospital operating income of $269,000, and a total income of $2.1 million. It provides for the funding of $22.7 million to support our affiliate operations and allows for compliance with all of our debt covenants. So with that, I'll turn the program over to Erica Luna, and she'll walk you through the details of the budget. Good evening, and thank you, Chris, for uh, the introduction, and Kimberly. And before I get started, I just want to reiterate uh, Chris's comments and say thank you to the executive team, management team, and finance team for their dedication and support throughout this process and their thoughtful input, allowing us to, to get to a, uh, a good budget plan for this next year. Um, and again, thank you to Chris and Kimberly for their leadership and support through this entire process. So with that, I'll jump into the key budget assumptions for the year. As uh, Chris discussed, with the pandemic situation hopefully subsiding and things starting to open back up, we do expect a volume to increase in most areas at at least 5%, with the exception of surgical cases increasing 1% and actually a decrease in patient days of 6% which we'll get into the detail on these a bit further in the presentation. Inflation on expenses is uh, mostly typical in labor and supplies and pharmaceuticals, what we typically see year over year in these areas. One area I do want to highlight is pension expense, which is based on um, the most recent actuarial um, report that's done after every calendar year. 
our, our pension plan uh, reached a fully funded status uh, in this current year, which is really good news for the health system um, and represents uh, a lot lower expenses for pension expenses and fund lower funding required in next, this next year, which you'll see as we get to the income statement. Insurance inflation you see is a bit high at 29%. And this is due to catastrophic losses over the last several years, uh, globally and nationally, that are in, impacting the insurance market industry-wide. So we, we've seen some increases last year, and they are continuing through the coming year. This is our high-level income statement. So you can see we anticipate a break-even operating income of $269,000 and a net income of $2.1 million. The funding of our affiliate operations, DEVCO and WTMF, of approximately $22.7 million, and our hospital EBITDA of $47.6 million, and consolidated, which includes the funding of affiliate operations, of $26.3 million for the year. Here we see admissions. We expect a 6% increase from the current year. And this is because of the overall growth assumptions of 5%, as well as targeted growth in certain inpatient surgical and inpatient cath lab cases, partially offset by the quality initiative to reduce readmissions. You'll notice that we are still about 17% lower than the pre-COVID fiscal 19 period. A big factor here is the shift in joint cases from inpatient to outpatient cases that was driven by changes in CMS guidelines over the last few years. Moving to admissions by payer. Here you'll see, and as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, um, we are budgeting our payer mix to be pretty consistent with what we are seeing. This can change if the long-term effects of the pandemic um, turn out, you know, as people if people lose their jobs in healthcare insurance, we could see an increase in the uninsured and underinsured population. Moving here to patient days. Normally patient days would correlate more closely with what we see in admissions. However, patient days are expected to decrease by 6%. A couple things going on here. In the current year with the pandemic, we, we were seeing patients that were much sicker and stayed on average much longer than normal. We do not expect this trend to continue, and in the past couple of months, we have already started to see it improve. In addition to that, we have implemented quality initiatives to improve length of stay and reduce readmissions for better patient outcomes. You'll see this impact of these initiatives throughout the rest of the presentation. Again, the decline from fiscal 19 is related to the shift in joint cases from inpatient to outpatient, as well as the impact of the initiative. Moving to average daily census, it mirrors the previous slide that we've seen and shows the average daily census by year. Here we have the... Oops, sorry. <laughs> Driver problem. Everything, yeah. <laughs> so the average length of stay is budgeted at 5.23, which is an improvement from the current length of stay. Again, the same two factors affecting patient days here, with uh, the current year being impacted by much sicker patients with much longer length of stay, as well as the quality initiatives um, targeting improvement in these areas. Outpatient observation days are expected to increase by 6.5%, reflecting the work around the quality initiatives that we just discussed. Deliveries. Deliveries is one of the areas uh, that has been slower to come back and has been impacted by the pandemic. Maternal child health is an area that we continue to target for growth as one of our strategic initiatives, but we do recognize that it will be a challenge. There has been a steady decline in the national birth rate and an even further decline since the onset of the pandemic. So we do have some work to do in this area. 
Total surgical cases are expected to increase 1% overall. This reflects growth in the inpatient cardiac program and other surgeries being offset by the outpatient joint replacement cases moving out of the hospital setting. An upcoming slide uh, outlines these changes in more detail coming up. Total cath lab cases are expected to increase by 5%, and this is consistent with the overall growth anticipated as we return to pre-COVID levels. Here we have the detail of the surgical and cath lab cases broken out by major categories. Here you can see that joint replacement cases are expected to decrease overall by almost 8%. Again, over 400 joint cases are expected to migrate to the outpatient surgery center. The outpatient surgery center is an affiliate of the health system, but is not a part of hospital operation. This migration is partially offset by growth in sur shoulder surgeries, as well as the recruitment of an orthopedic surgeon during the year. Cardiac surgical cases, you can see, are expected to improve by about 20% as we see continued growth in the cardiac services program, which is also one of our strategic initiatives. In line with the overall growth trends and physician expectations for the year, neurosurgical cases are expected to increase 8% and other surgical cases by about 6%. Moving on to cath lab cases. Cardiac cases are increasing almost 8% with the recruitment of a new interventional cardiologist expected to start in January. The other categories are in line with the overall growth expectations and physician expectations for the year. Emergency room visits, like deliveries, this has been an area that's been slower to return to pre-COVID levels. We are budgeting a 5% increase, but are still tracking well below fiscal 19. ER visits remain depressed across most hospitals in the nation and region since the onset of the pandemic and are currently running at about 85% of pre-COVID normal and our budget um, reflects an 11% uh, shortfall from pre-COVID. With continuing efforts to educate the community that the hospital is safe and the healthcare should not be delayed, we do expect an increase in the coming year. Outpatient visits, on the other hand, are budgeted to increase about 5% to over 89,000 cases, cases, which is very close to the pre-COVID um, of 90,000. Moving into productivity indicators, Total FTEs at 1,456.9 FTEs represents a decrease of 52.3 FTEs in the year. Budgeted increases in volumes are offset by the decrease in patient days related to the quality initiatives and result in lower FTEs. Also, the additional FTEs required solely due to COVID have mostly been eliminated as COVID-19 workflows have been integrated into our normal operations. FTEs per AOB are increasing by 3.5%, and we have uh, still some work to do to bring this more in line. Patient service revenue. Gross patient revenue is budgeted to decrease by less than 1%, with the increases in patient volumes being offset by the decline in patient days and migration of outpatient joint replacements. Contractual allowances as a percent of gross charges <coughs> is expected to be 75.6% compared to 76%. The improvement here is primarily due to negotiated rate increases from commercial payers. Net patient service revenue at 478.6 million represents a 1.6% improvement from the current year projection. The next slide shows the graph of net patient service revenue. And the trend mirrors what we've seen in the volume graphs with improvement from the current year 
as we move towards recovering um, back to pre-COVID levels. Other operating revenue is increasing by almost 16% due to services impacted by the pandemic starting to return to normal operations, such as cafeteria and health education services, which include wellness classes um, expected to resume in the coming year. Operating expenses are expected to decrease by 1.2% overall. Salaries are expected to remain flat due to wage inflation being offset by the decrease in FTEs discussed a minute ago. Employee benefits are expected to decrease 7.6% due to the significant cost savings in pension expense partially offset by increases in employee health care, dental, and vision expense. Professional fees are expected to increase due to physician recruitment and increases in hospitalist fees. Supplies are expected to decrease due to less COVID-19 supplies, anticipated lower patient days, and the implementation of cost-saving initiatives, which are partially offsetting the inflation in supplies and pharmaceutical expenses. Purchase services are expected to decrease due to the reduction in contracted services as we implement COVID-19 workflows into our normal processes and bring certain lab services in-house. Utilities are increasing with inflation. Insurance also increasing with inflation as previously discussed. Marketing and advertising is expected to increase with campaigns for cardiac service program and the Warm Springs market. Software license is increasing due to inflation and newer software coming off the initial license periods. Other expenses are decreasing 2.5% and depreciation is decreasing 1%. The next slide shows the distribution of expenses with labor being the highest uh, category. Earnings before interest, next slide please. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Hospital EBITDA is budgeted at 47.6 million and represents a significant improvement compared to the current year. Non-operating income and expense. Investment income is expected to increase due to higher account balances earning interest during the year. Geo bond property tax revenue is pretty consistent the prior year. Interest expense is budgeted to decrease about 6%. This improvement is due to refinancing of the 2010 bond in December of 2020 and lower principal balances. Rental income is slightly lower than the projection due to current vacancies. Bond issuance cost is expected to be 600,000 as we anticipate a geo bond issue in April of 2022. Foundation donations are expected to be about $1 million. In the current year, we raised almost 3 million. We are thankful to the community that came together and raised additional funds to support our COVID efforts. Federal subsidies are not budgeted as it remains very uncertain whether um, Washington will receive any uh, federal relief. Gains and losses on investments are not budgeted per district policy due to the unpredictability of financial markets. Capital spending. New capital requests total $8.2 million for the year, and committed capital, which includes approved projects with anticipated spending in fiscal 22, totaling $11.2 million. These projects are aligned with the strategic initiatives discussed earlier in the presentation. The combined total for the new and committed capital is $19.4 million, and the sources of funding include geobond financing, revenue project funds available, and funds from operations.
this slide uh, lists out the equipment totaling $3.8 million and mostly represents um, replacement of existing equipment that's required for us to stay current. The next slide outlines the different facility and IT projects. And the largest item here are tenant improvements required in the Fremont Office Center in order to secure new long-term tenants. This slide here represents projects that are under development and have not been included in the budget. For your reference, as, as these plans evolve, they, we may come back to the, to the board for approval on one or more of these. That concludes my presentation for the day. Are there any questions? Well, thank you very much. Kimberly, do you have any concluding remarks? Um, yeah, I, I do just want to, again, um, first of all, as Chris has stated in his remarks, say that um, this is the third budget that we have now presented that has been impacted to some degree with COVID, if you think about it. And um, so I believe there is still uncertainty as to uh, the economic impacts. And truly, we know we're going to be living with COVID um, for some time to come. And um, though we feel like we're coming into what that new normal will be, there is still some degree of uncertainty as to exactly what um, that how how we will function in that new normal, and we're no different than any other hospital um, that is that all hospitals are facing this. But I truly believe we put together what we feel is a very strong uh, best estimate as to given the factors that we know today, and it's really focusing now on as Chris mentioned that road to recovery and that growth so that we can continue to be there to meet the needs of our community now and into the future. And I also just want to thank uh, Chris Henry for all of the work that he has done to put together this budget and the collaborative effort that, um, that has, has it's been this year. So I want to thank you for that. And again, thank Erica too. So um, we feel it's uh, a very um, good budget and uh, to be presenting tonight to the board. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I too, and I'm sure the board shares the appreciation for all the hard work that you, Kimberly, and your whole team, Chris, Erica, Dan, Stephanie, Tina, all the frontline managers have done to really do your best job in trying to gather the information and estimates that are help, help guide the budget process. I think uh, you're correct. The operative word is uncertainty. And it kind of reminds me of one, he, one of Yogi Berra's famous quotes where he said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So uh, I, I think you've polished the crystal ball fairly well. And uh, I would characterize the budget that you've developed for us as uh, hopeful realism. And we're, we're, I think it's realistic in what uh, you've made as far as the projections and uh, changes either upwards or downwards in product lines. But it also reflects the hopefulness that we have that things will get better this next year of uh, following the uh, excellent uh, vaccination program which has happened and uh, the marked drop in the COVID cases that have dramatically impacted the hospital over this past year. So I really appreciate all, all the hard work. I would invite uh, the other board members to ask questions or make comments. I, I don't have any questions, but I, I like what you said, Dr. Nicholson, about being hopefully realistic. I was thinking, this is a very optimistic uh, budget, but it's very reasonable. And we want what's best for our district. And you gotta, you gotta shoot high and, and remain hopeful. And so thank you. Thank you for this budget. Um, that just gives great encouragement that things are going to get better.
Uh, yeah, I just want to yeah, I, uh, uh, echo what uh, uh, Bill and Jeannie have said. Uh, and I think we've already seen the changes uh, uh, from the, the months last year compared to the months this year. Um, that uh, gives all the reason to be hopeful that uh, we're going to work our way out of the, of the mess. So thank you. Thank you all. I would just echo what everybody else has said. Uh, really uh, a tremendous amount of work. And I'd like to thank everybody that was involved in it. Great. Yep. Great work. I think it's better to be conservative because, uh, you know, most of the national numbers are dropping. I mean, the birth rates, fertility rate is dropping, ER visits are dropping. Uh, those are all not good news for our hospital system. But uh, I think it's better to be conservative. And plus, with all this, there's so much of uncertainty. But, you know, great work. Thanks. Great. Well, well thank you so much for those comments. And uh, I'm going to take the action item on the budget uh, early in our agenda. And uh, I believe, uh, Mr. Wallace, you have a motion. Uh, yes, Mr. President, in accordance with district law policies and procedures, I move for the adoption of resolution number 1228, which is the budget estimate for fiscal year 2021-2022. This resolution provides for the necessary funds required for the operation of the district and for the continued support of the Washington Township Hospital Development Corporation in its operations to promote the charitable and community service mission of the district. Thank you. We have the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Director Epen. Uh, any discussion? Uh, if not, then we'll go ahead and have a roll call vote. D. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Yi? Aye. Director Stewart? Aye. Director Epen? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. The budget is approved. And uh, Erica, Chris, congratulations and uh, take it easy for a few days, <laughs> but not for very long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, for that vote. We really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. it's a lot of hard work, so we really appreciate it. Okay, we'll now uh, get back to our uh, regular agenda and uh, we'll go on with our medical staff report. Dr. Killaroo. Thank you. Um, so right now uh, we have uh, 585 members in the medical staff out of which 350 are active members. We have another 56 that are provisional active and 96 that are ambulatory. Um, so that's as far as the numbers. They've been hovering, as I had mentioned earlier, between 580 to 600. My expectation is as July comes around and the residencies are completed, we should be seeing an uptick in the number of uh, uh, physicians that we have on staff. Um, I wanted to also uh, inform you that we had our uh, quarterly uh, medical staff meeting yesterday. Uh, it was very well attended. I think we had, we picked it around 145 uh, physicians that had attended, which is, I think one of the advantages of Zoom is that we have a lot more people and they, and towards, the, and it was a relatively long meeting because we had a lot of uh, agenda items to, to go through, but even an hour and a half into the meeting, I think almost 90 people were still there at the end. So uh, this format seems to work better uh, for those large, large meetings. Um, we had talked about our magnet certification as well as, well, pending certification and our, our JCO um, survey uh, to, the, to the medical staff in general. Um, the medical staff leadership has been also looking at utilization management, and Dr. Chanta had made a presentation about some of the denials and, 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 and the difficulties that uh, utilization management has been having. Uh, and he's actually going to be going to each of the departments and giving a presentation, a more detailed presentation to each of the departments. And that should hopefully help with uh, our goal to reduce our length of stay and also to make sure that our documentation is appropriate. Um, and, and hope to be able to report back uh, some success associated with that. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to say thank you. I've been chief of staff for the last two years and my term ends 
uh, the end of this month. And Dr. Haider is, is here today to take on the baton and, and carry it forward. Um, we will still be around. One of the advantages of the way that our system is set up is that uh, I'll be around for at least another two years as, as the chief of staff, as the past chief of staff. And Dr. Tim Choi is, is staying on as the uh, liaison officer. So there will be some continuity uh, in that. But I wanted to thank the board for the support uh, and for all of the meetings, not just in this public forum, but uh, the guidance in the, in the private forums that have helped us kind of navigate this difficult uh, last couple of years. Thank you very much, Dr. Kellerou. You know, on behalf of the board, uh, we really want to thank your great leadership over the last two years. You've done quite a bit getting the bylaws revised, uh, getting us through the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, and all the great cooperation which has occurred between the medical staff and the administration. Uh, and uh, from the board level, we're really happy with how things are going at the uh, medical staff uh, level. Um, I myself attended the uh, medical staff meeting last night, and I think it's a wonderful uh, way in which to get everybody involved. I think it's uh, the way of the future. Um, and it was very well run. I really enjoyed Dr. Uh, Achanta's presentation on utilization review. And, and I think that's uh, those are healthy things to share with our medical staff. Uh, my most important comment is that you've set the bar really, really high. Thank and you. so it's going to be a <laughs> real challenge uh, for Dr. Heider. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, grateful for all the great work that you've done. And I know that you will be giving him lots of support and guidance in this next year. And my expectation is that he will do at least as well hopefully better, but that's a high bar. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much. And and so when is the uh, dinner dance? Because I think the board members might want to go to that. I understand we're having a dinner dance in August. Yes. So I apologize. I should have mentioned that we, we do have a date. It was um, we were trying to find a place that would be suitable and also in an outdoor setting so that uh, the interactions would be a little bit uh, safer. So it's going to be on August 7th at the Baroni's restaurant in Pleasanton. Um, they have a large outdoor venue and the entertainment committee and myself went and looked at it last weekend and we felt that that was um, adequate for our needs. Um, Great. Well, it's there will be a more formal invitation from the, uh, the entertainment committee coming out in the next week or two. Yeah. Well, we all uh, we all look forward to meeting in person. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again, Dr. Killer. OK, our next agenda item is a service league report. Uh, Debbie, what you got for us? Oh, you're on mute. Un there you go. Yeah, I just had to unmute. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I. Well, we had uh, 41 members this last month and uh, 652 hours that we served, um, volunteered, and um, it was slightly down a little bit from the, the other ones, but we are bringing back volunteers. Uh, we are uh, training uh, four volunteers four times a week for nursing unit assist. Um, we have six volunteers staffed at the surgery liaison as surgery liaisons in the surgery waiting area. Um, we have 16 volunteers, I'm sorry, we have uh, one in the imaging center that's greeting patients. And um, in the future, we, you know, pretty soon in the future, we will be having more volunteers um, staffing other assignments, including Wolf. And so bringing back the canines and their handlers. So little families. <laughs> and um, I'm real happy that the volunteers are coming to me and telling me of how welcomed they are from all the staff, the physicians, the nurses, the CNAs, everybody. And, and I see it too, because I do, I do training and I volunteer. So I see it and they're just so thankful and it's so welcoming. It brings tears. It is just 
so wonderful. And I want to thank Washington Hospital for making us feel so welcome. Really. I mean, it touches my heart. So that's pretty much my report. So, and I want to thank you. Well, we should be thanking you, you know, the community and the patients and the families. Thank you. You're so welcome. And uh, in the hospital, it's so good to see you back. It's, it's, it's great. We're going to have some of the four legged volunteers uh, yes. uh, wandering <laughs> the halls <laughs> as well. So uh, that actually, you might want to explain that to the, uh, the uh, audience here as far as who those four legged volunteers are. They have well, who they are is their um, volunteers that have already been volunteers and they have gone through special training and been certified by, um, I think one is TIGA, there's another one, and they have to go through uh, loud noises, um, no barking, uh, they can't have any accidents. Um, so they're really well behaved and well trained. And um, some of the areas that they'll go into have to, are, uh, approved by the physicians, we're still bringing this back and trying to figure out exactly how it's going to be done. A lot of it also is for the staff. Um, it's to be able to pet a, a nice little dog and, you know, some of them are rather large, but it, it is calming. It, it, it's good for you to be able to see the animals. And so, but they're all highly trained and they have all kinds of shots and everything. So they're very safe, very safe. And they're all badged and everything, just like the human volunteers, they go through the whole thing too. So it's really um, exciting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great program and it brings so much uh, comfort and joy. And as you said, not only to the uh, patients who uh, clearly are in most need of the comforting and uh, the reassurance and the joy that uh, the, the dogs will bring, but also to the staff members. I think we're always happy to see the, the dogs around. Yeah. So uh, great work, Debbie, and great work Thank to you. the Service League and keep it up. And we look forward to your next report with even more of the return towards uh, normal and, uh, and beyond. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll now move on to uh, our uh, lean report. And that's going to be about our COVID vaccine. And Kimberly, if you could introduce uh, Michelle. Yes, it's uh, my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Michelle Hudson. Uh, she's Senior Director of Operations and Administrative Services at Washington Township Medical Foundation. Uh, Michelle received a Bachelor of Science degree in Organizational Behavior and Leadership and a Master's of Public Health Public Administration degree from the University of San Francisco. Prior to her role at Washington Township Medical Foundation, she worked in healthcare leadership focused on operations, communications, and marketing human resources, as well as program and fund development. Michelle came on board as Director of Human Resources in 2017 and became an integral part of Washington Township Medical Foundation. She became Director of Administrative Services in 2018 and was appointed Senior Director of Operations and Administrative Services in 2019. Michelle currently provides oversight and leadership to the operations of the uh, Medical Foundation Clinic manages human resources, communication administration, and plays a key role in the implementation of new programs and services, and is passionate about mentoring and development of staff. I also want to say she was really, really the key lead in uh, setting up and implementing our COVID vaccine clinic that uh, began on February 1st. So um, we, we really do want to thank you, Michelle, for all that you've done um, the past uh, number of months to ensure that our, our community um, get, has been able to be vaccinated. So uh, this evening, she is going to talk about um, how really how we applied uh, lean principles to the vaccination clinic and that lean journey. So I will turn it over to you, Michelle. You need to unmute too. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as you'll see towards the end of this presentation, um, this really took such a partnership, and there's so many, so many people to thank. But really, you know, thank you to Tina Nunez and Kimberly and all the executive leadership who really um, approved and supported this project um, that you know has been going on since February and um, continuing on for some time. Um, there's so many people who, again, really. Um, put in so much work and time for this, you know, from our providers to department leaders, volunteers, staff, um, as well as the lean office. Um, and as you'll see, they were really instrumental, particularly um, Dr. Kirk John, who I know is on this call. Um, it would, and it would be hard to find really um, any leader in the organization that didn't step up and, and help. So thank you for that. Um, also, thank you for allowing me to present about this project that I'm just really grateful to have been a part of. Um, and where lean principles really were necessary, even to just from the initial design of this project and the ongoing management and continuous improvement. Because um, as you'll see, we definitely had to, um, you know, make some changes along the way. Um, so in terms of lean principles, uh, you know, that we used, you know, all of these were really important, but particularly keeping in mind the patient first ethic. Um, and, you know, we really needed to design this this clinic and this process so that patients had a positive experience, um, which means that, you know, they needed to be able to get through the process safely and efficiently um, and, you know, share that experience with other people here in the district. Um, we really knew that part of our mandate was to serve the whole district, not only those who were part of the healthcare system. And in terms of, you know, organization and flow, you know, again, we needed to make sure that people, you know, moved through the clinic and moved through the process. Um, you know, efficiently and had a really good experience and made sure that there was constant transparency and accountability and the ability to do, you know, PDC, PDCA and make sure that what we were doing was still working, um, even, you know, with the many changes and challenges that came our way. Um, you know, and, and, and challenges there were. So just the urgency um, of the pandemic itself, you know, as you've heard, you know, tonight, and I'm sure, you know, in many different forms over the last 16 months, right, the urgency of the pandemic and the need to really, um, you know, get the vaccine out quickly and to as many people as possible. Um, you know, in addition to that, the criteria shifted um, pretty regularly. So, you know, sometimes from week to week, sometimes within days. And, you know, a lot of times we didn't have a lot of notice when they were opening up new tiers or new eligibility within the tiers. So we had to be able to quickly, um, you know, change and respond to those. Um, you know, the uncertainty of the vaccine supply, you know, there were times where it was really hard for us to get vaccine, you know, and some times that, you know, we ended up getting more vaccine, you know, than we had demand. So really um, learning to, to deal with that uncertainty. Um, the rigorous vaccine handling requirements, um, truly without the partnership with um, pharmacy and Mintu Dennett, our pharmacy director, um, it, would, it would have been difficult because, um, you know, we really had to make sure that, again, we were storing the vaccine properly and administering it properly. Um, there were multiple vaccine manufacturers, so that really influenced, um, you know, the second dose schedule. And, you know, as many of you know, because I know you had experience with the clinic, um, we were fortunate to get mostly the Pfizer vaccine to help build our schedule. But um, there were times when, you know, we had other vaccines we were getting as well. Um, and then the physical distancing requirements that really affected our space design. And then balancing the no-shows and the walk-ins. We constantly were refining our process um, in order to ensure that there was no waste. So, um, you know, the planning phase, this is definitely something we didn't have a, a blueprint for or a playbook for. Um, you know, we, we hadn't done this. And so we needed to really go to the places where there, there had been some experience, at least with the vaccination. So, you know, we did go to the Gemba and do observation. Um, there was an employee vaccine effort going on within the healthcare system. Um, Many of the people who were involved in designing our clinic had um, spent some time either working there. We also spent time going there to observe. Um, we walked the physical spaces that we had available um, to uh, host the clinic itself. And then we also really looked at other organizations that had started vaccinating. So um, 
you know, some other organizations were giving online presentations about lessons that they had learned. We did go to, you know, some of our, um, some of the other health providers in the area, like Bay Area Community Health and Kaiser, to see what they were doing. Um, some were doing drive throughs and some were doing, um, you know, physical clinics inside. So we really wanted to see what they were doing that worked. Um, and we had to use our data. So to start, you know, the initial tier, we started vaccinating 65 and over um, before any of the tier 1As or anything opened. So in terms of numbers, we used, you know, we looked at our patient database and saw our patients that we had that were 65 and over. And we had to use, um, you know, the data that was out there in terms of people who were declining or possibly getting vaccines elsewhere and really say, this is how many people we want to vac vaccinate in this amount of time. And in order to do so, what are the resources um, and the space design that we need? Um, and then in terms of developing our processes, so we really were deliberate about designing each process, um, you know, to really plan each stage. So, you know, obviously scheduling was something huge that, that really shifted over these last few months. And, and you'll hear a bit more about that. Um, you know, check-in, vaccination, check-out and observation. We knew that those were um, those were the were the roles. No matter where we, if we did these in the clinic, if we did them in the drive, if we vaccinated at the drive-through. So um, and really using process mapping tools to drill down on specifics. Um, I know the picture is small there, but kind of how our clinic started out is people entered, went to registration there on the right, vaccination in the middle, and then observation there on the left. Um, and they did, you know, spend some time, you know, 15 to 30 minutes there on observation. And then training and workflow simulations um, prior to go live. We did have to bring on um, whole new staffing to support the clinic and the call center. So we really had to, you know, get them on board quickly, get them trained, and then do some, um, some kind of live simulations to walk, walk them through the process so that we could be um, ready to go as soon as we open the doors that Monday morning. Um, scheduling was incredibly important and uh, the way we have been scheduling patients has shifted um, throughout the life of the clinic. So um, we did start by opening up a um, call center. We opened up that call center within 24 hours. Um, and so before we had staff hired, we had you know administrative staff and some management in their booking appointments. Um, we really wanted to make sure that when we opened that clinic a week and a half later on February 1st, that we had a full schedule. We also went to online access. So it really was a time for us to use our MyChart and all of the patients we've been recruiting onto MyChart over the years so they could schedule their own appointments. So we pulled MyChart and sent out messaging to people who met the current criteria as the tiers changed. We also set up web-based open scheduling um, for unaffiliated district patients. So people could come onto our website if they needed an appointment and they could schedule an appointment um, without having their own mind chart. Um, and that helped, you know, people could also call the call center that weren't current patients, but um, you know, the call center was experiencing really heavy wait times, especially at the beginning. So this is a way for people to get on and book their appointments quickly. It was also a way for people to be able to share the link um, with their, in their own networks so that the people that they knew could get on and schedule vaccine appointments as well. Um, and there were various um, vaccine clinic roles um, and there were some, you know, ancillary roles, obviously, and, and other partnerships. But really, you know, these were the roles that were important in every clinic that we did, whether it was here in the Anderson Auditorium, whether it was in the parking lot um, of the 2500 building there, or um, if it was offsite, you know, at Tesla or at you know, Newark Memorial, you know, there needed to be somebody overseeing the clinic um, or was vaccine prep. And again, we had the um, ability to have pharmacy actually prep all the vaccines for us. Um, you know, where people should park, you know, we had designated parking here in Anderson, as well as, you know, through the drive-throughs for, you know, observation, um, screening and registration, obviously vaccination and monitoring, I mean, just making sure that we have the supplies. So coordinating and running supplies and vaccines, I um, mean, checking out, and we really did have volunteer support. So it was really great to hear the report about the service league, because we did have service league volunteers come in as well as community support. So, um, you know, looking at the time it took, 
you know, for each one of these roles. And even though the number of people in these roles um, may have changed depending on how we redesign the process, those were the constant um, roles that we had in place. Um, so clinic flow was really important. Again, you know, we wanted to make sure people got through um, efficiently and safely. Um, so really, you know, turning Anderson Auditorium within a few days from the auditorium that we all know into, into a functioning clinic. So that did take supplies. Um, you know, phones were put in there to run, you know, the phone lines that were there, lots of computers, scanners. Um, you know, if anybody has, has been past there, you'll see that there's, there's a lot of equipment that had to be brought on very quickly. Um, and in terms of the Epic and IT build, really building the schedule with an Epic, um, we actually brought on text messaging for appointment reminders for the first time through this process, because we wanted to make sure that people um, were reminded about their appointment could show up and then let us know if they weren't coming. And that really helped us um, count, you know, how many people would be either canceling or no showing. And it really helped with our end of day, um, you know, extra doses that we had. Uh, adverse reaction reporting, we had to really get trained and come online, um, you know, with all of this and so really have the equipment that we needed. Um, and really the, um, the goal was really to minimize waiting. So we didn't want people to have to wait a long time to come in. And we wanted there to be visual management and so they could see where to go in every step of the process. Um, patient flow, so here, here's some pictures. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, patients did come in and enter through the Civic Center um, old employee entrance that had been closed during COVID. So there was a dedicated entrance where we had um, the parking lot there open for folks with vaccination appointments. And we had security out there and they only let in people that had appointments so that we could make sure there was dedicated parking. Um, they could come in there through the door. They were screened, given their consent forms, uh, registered so that we could confirm who they were, collect all their documentation, um, and then the vaccination and the post-vaccine observation where people um, were observed for either 15 to 30 minutes, depending on their situation. Um, the visual management became really important. Um, we did have morning huddles and evening huddles, which were really important. And you'll see there, um, there's an example of our daily readiness huddle board. So really in the morning, it was to make sure, you know, how can we make sure that today goes smoothly? You know, what is our appointment count? Um, are there any issues that we need to be aware of? Do we have any staffing issues, equipment issues? I know you're very familiar with what the daily huddle boards look like. Um, and then really at the end of the day for a debrief. Um, so we can capture issues that have come up and make corrections for the next day. We also really use this time to, um, you know, read some of the positive feedback that had come through about the COVID clinic. I mean, there were some days where, you know, they had seen upwards of 750 or 800 people. So really giving them that feedback, um, you know, that people were really happy, you know, with their work and that they were putting that out there in the community, I think was really helpful. Um, there was signaling for patients to promote flow. So we didn't always have a lot of people available to do wayfinding. So, you know, how would patients know that the, um, you know, registration clerk was available to check them in? How would they know that a vaccinator was available? So we started using signage for that. We also started using signage for um, registration clerks with language capacity. So, um, you know, we had, um, you know, the signs up there so they would know which, which lane to go in to check in and then emergency response, which we had um, the supplies always on hand in case there was an adverse reaction. Um, standard work was incredibly important, um, a really important key lean principle that we use. Again, we were having um, a lot of new staff come on board. We needed to train them very quickly. We made changes to the number of people we needed to enroll. So we needed to cross train staff and be able to move them. Um, and, and really orient new hires that were not familiar, you know, with working here at the healthcare district. Um, having standard work also allowed us to move locations. So to, um, you know, hone our process here on Anderson and to be able to move into the parking lot um, and do, you know, even larger drive-through vaccination clinics and then move offsite to do clinics at Tesla, again, at Newark Memorial um, and make sure that, you know, everything was done properly. Um, transparency and accountability. We did have a daily vaccine call um, with leadership and stakeholders. We had 
the operations leadership team. Um, we had always had pharmacy on, we had IS on, finance, a lot of the different um, content experts that were on every day so we could respond to issues quickly. Um, you know, what is the vaccine on hand? You know, what is the new tier, the new eligibility? How can we get more patients to register? We had shared document files for project planning and reporting so that, you know, operations and pharmacy both knew, you know, again, how much vaccine was on hand. We could report how many vaccinations given, um, you know, and different departments would have that for the reporting that they needed, um, as well as the daily um, operational huddle there in the clinic. Um, PDCA became very helpful, plan, do, check, act, because um, things changed. So we had to continuously improve what we were doing. So scheduling, um, you know, again, we had the call center and we had to shift the work that they were doing um, based on demand, putting um, online access to appointments, my chart versus open scheduling um, that people could go to on the website. I can't say how vital the partnership with IS was um, from the call center to open scheduling. Um, this was the first time we'd had um, the public come online and be able to schedule an appointment directly with um, with any of our clinics. So it was there was a lot of lessons learned there, and I think um, a lot of really good work happened. Um, and then again, integrating our open scheduling with my turn once um, once the vaccine distribution shifted to Blue Shield. So again, there was daily discussions of changes and requirements. Um, and cross training, we definitely you know were able to you know utilize our staff a lot more effectively with the training and um, again, the partnership with Epic was, was important. And they really, I mean, they were on calls with us every day and then, you know, and then calls later on to really drill down um, into different projects. Um, another example was the check-in checkout process. Um, we quickly realized that check-in became a bottleneck for patients that were not current um, patients of the system or who had not been um, in for a while, we had to make sure that their information was current so that their demographic information was current, their insurance information was current. I mean, we did find it, and sometimes it was much easier to get that information beforehand so that registration wasn't a bottleneck. You know, sometimes the forms were cumbersome. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of, you know, anxiety depending on, you know, what was changing with the different types of vaccines or the different tiers. So we really did a modified checkout and shifted staff you know, again, um, and initiated pre-registration phone calls. This was particularly important with our partnership with Tesla so that we could move those, move the employees there through really quickly um, and, you know, check people on kind of with mobile phones instead of doing the full registration process there on site. Um, added volunteers to be wayfinders to move through the process and streamlined our forms. Um, we continuously had to change our consent forms based on the changing criteria and, and also for reporting. Once we moved to my turn and Blue Shield, the reporting requirements increased. So we had to make sure that we collected all of that information and made sure that billing really had the information they needed because if we were collecting all the information then it really made their job a lot more difficult. So they were also on daily calls with us as well, um, billing was. And um, another thing that we had to do to improve is, um, again, we did move locations. So from Anderson, to weekend drive throughs for both first and second doses. Um, and then it really also enabled us to get out in the community, which we thought was really important. Um, Tesla really relied on us. We were um, the organization that vaccinated at their flagship site here in Fremont. So again, we vaccinated over 5,000 of their employees. Um, and you know, we also went out to Newark High School and Newark Junior High. And you know, each site you know, required different adjustments. And because we had the standard work and because we were able to, you know, scale up and scale down and really kind of modify and be nimble, um, you know, it really helped us. So one of the things that was really important was increasing our volunteers for the drive-through. Um, it allowed us to operate in a really large space. You know, the 2,500 building parking lot is large. There were some days we did 1,000 um, patients. So getting people from check-in to vaccination and also observation, um, was really important and that, um, and really, especially with the weekend clinics, a lot of the people who volunteered were the providers here in the healthcare system. And I can't say how important that was. Um, we had a lot of providers volunteer. They had a great experience. They talked to their colleagues. Um, we had patients coming through who, you know, knew their doctor. Um, and I think it just really, really added to the, um, you know, positive feeling and, you know, community 
response that we got. Um, there was one weekend that I was there that we had a woman come in and there was a provider vaccinating who had delivered her baby. So she wanted to make sure that that doctor vaccinated her. Um, and really, you know, they just had a good time and it felt really good for the staff and the providers to be working together in partnership. Um, the vaccination numbers, as you'll see um, from the months, really scaled up and scaled down based on, based on demand and um, tier the criteria opening up. So in April, um, not only did the criteria open up, but we did a lot of um, vaccinations there at Tesla. So you'll see those reflected in the numbers. Um, you know, it was really, um, you know, when, when, when tiers were eligible, we were really ready to bring them in. So we were ready with the new consent forms. We were ready to allow them to book. You know, we had to shift our, you know, online language. So really, you know, moving the website, moving the, you know, my turn and the open scheduling language, you know, and really using the Lean's principles allowed us to scale up, scale down, you know, move locations and really meet the demand, um, the demand, you know, of the community. So um, as you'll see there, there in May, I think um, the demand may have gone down a bit. Uh, we definitely, at, that was the time that we started vaccinating um, 12 and over. So, um, you know, and now we do believe, we still are scheduling a lot of first dose appointments and second dose appointments. And we are moving um, from the Anderson Auditorium into the um, library within the next few weeks, because we believe that that's kind of where the demand is right now. And we're able to change the scheduling to do that. So it was really um, having all of that in place so we felt comfortable, you know, increasing the numbers a day, sometimes up to 800, and then be able to scale down and maybe go mobile, you know, for a day here or there. So, and I think without that, without that information and that partnership with the lean office, it would have been um, difficult. So um, really this was about teamwork and there's too many people to thank. I think if you, all the um, Members of leadership here from the healthcare system who are even on this call probably helped us at some point um, throughout this endeavor. Really, um, you know, the members of our team, Joey Sanchez and Jeff Van Dorn, who uh, manage the day-to-day -day vaccine clinic and also the project itself. Um, you know, I can't I can't thank them enough. You know, in addition, like I said, that you know, the pharmacy senior leadership, you know, Dan Nardoni and his his revenue cycle team, Jennifer Sheldon, I mean the coders and the billers. You know, they, as you see, they um, had to, I think, code and, you know, send out that was about what 60,000 um, additional <laughs> bills than they had been. Um, and really, again, medical staff, the administrative staff, volunteer office, um, the volunteers, I mean, everybody from security to food service to facilities, community relations. I mean, we had a Hasella in there. Um, you know, you know, meeting with um, the patients there and talking about their experience. Um, and again, I can't say how valuable the IS team. I think we really, um, we really made some great things happen, and we really stepped outside the box of what how we had normally um, conducted business to make sure that all those people could be scheduled. Um, Mary Barron and Jeff, Dr. Jeff Stewart, led the um, you know, vaccine task force for the whole healthcare system, so they won constant um, communication. I do want to go back to the Kaizen office. Um, Dr. Kirk John was really with us from the very beginning of this. Um, she was there with us at night when we were trying to get rid of extra doses. She just every step of the process really helping us um, in addition to being on the daily calls. So um, I think there were so many people that really, you know, again, they came, you know, they came in on the weekends to, to be with us. You know, they were there with us in the evening. They really went above and beyond. Um, and again, you know, Tina Nunez, the president of of Whitmiff, um, thank you very much. And, and Kimberly, again, for your approval and support and all the executive team. Um, and it's something that I think we're all really proud of and just, you know, it just felt really good to be part of the healthcare system and this, you know, district hospital that really was out there on the forefront of trying to end the pandemic. So um, thank you to all of you for your support. And are there any questions? Well, I, I'm sure there are comments from the other board members. I would invite those. I just can't, I got to say, I, I've, I've had so many uh, community members come up, up to me and, and thank, thank, uh, Thank me as if I did anything. I know that you, 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 you folks did all the work, but uh, it has been 
there's such a uh, feeling of appreciation in the community. Um, uh, t- uh, today, I, today I was talking to a 92 year old uh, fella that he was he was just so thrilled that. He couldn't believe that the hospital actually reached out to him and said, hey, get in here and get your shot and uh, early on in in the whole process. So uh, uh, just thank you so much for what you've done. I, too, want to thank you. Um, We are just so proud of the way that you collectively represented the hospital to the district by the way that you took care of our district residents. I had a friend who was a, a, um, a Kaiser member, could not get her shot, could not get her shot for, you know, recovering cancer patient. And she got in uh, Washington and got through and she just could not say enough about how well she was treated, how organized and how smooth everything. I mean, that's been the feedback overall is what a, what a great experience. Um, everybody felt they were cared for, it was smooth and very efficient. Um, and, you know, personally, as a volunteer, you know, working in the pharmacy, labeling syringes and, and even, you know, being in uh, the room where you were having clinic on days where they were giving Johnson & Johnson and you have, you know, it was really um, really tight because of the short window that they, um, uh, the syringes had to be made. Um, I got to be close and I got to hear, nobody knew I was listening, but your staff were incredible. They were so positive, um, so encouraging, just offering to take pictures for uh, the, the people that just had gotten vaccinated. They want to get their picture in, in front of the big sign. And, and everybody was so encouraging and so positive. It was such a pleasure to be in that environment. And so I just thank you and thank all the staff for the hard, hard work that that was. But you did a great job. Thank you to all of you. It's incredibly wonderful experience to, to uh, be around and have so many people thanking us for what we did. Uh, and I say we, uh, I'm, I'm like Mike, I didn't have a whole lot to do with it. But uh, wonderful, wonderful experience for the community. It's, it's hard to go around anywhere without someone mentioning how wonderful uh, things were at the hospital. Thank you very, very much. It's been an absolutely spectacular experience. What I, one of the comments that I got con- constantly, the, 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 and I probably, I can't tell you how many people, uh, but the most common, um, comment was how well organized uh, the whole process was and how easy it was. And, um, and I'm sure those people uh, were great ambassadors for uh, others in the community to, to say, hey, get, get in there and get it. It's, it's going to be really <laughs> easy. And, and, uh, and so my hat's off to you for the way that you've organized the the effort there is just, just beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah, so like, you know, Mike was saying, I mean, to have such a seamless operation with some new vaccines, I mean, especially mostly, uh, Michelle was saying it was Pfizer, and it's not easy to have, uh, you know, Pfizer vaccination with all the cold chain operations uh, without minimal wastage to have all these people vaccinated. uh, It's not easy at all. Um, and this hard work is, uh, you know, shown in numbers. I think uh, Fremont has got about 84, 85 percent of people vaccinated, at least with one dose. Uh, Union City has got about 82, and um, Newark is almost close to 80. So I think they're great numbers. This is all a reflection of hard work. Uh, great job. Keep it up. Yeah, Michelle. A- absolutely stellar performance. Uh, this, this, the work that was done in the vaccination clinic represents the highest and best of what our district can do for our community. You know, I liken the vaccine clinic to uh, 
a high performance vehicle. Uh, you went from zero to 800 vaccines a day, uh, you know, faster than those four wheel drive high performance Teslas. You know, it was, uh, it was great. And uh, you were driving down a road which had a lot of twists and turns, but you had a great pit crew. They changed the tires, changed the vaccines, they changed the engine, whatever was necessary, you got it done. And in the end, you really delivered to the to our community. You delivered the vaccine, you saved lives, you really brought, brought a lot of peace uh, and comfort to everybody in the community. So um, thank you for giving us a view under the hood as far as how you use lean to actually make this, uh, make this uh, high performance vehicle perform so well. So now we understand a little bit of what actually worked and that'll be a model uh, for us to use in the future as we as we move forward down this road. We still don't know where this road ends, but I know the, the vehicle that you've built uh, has served us very well. So you know you get the you get the the big trophy uh, to to carry around. Uh, but thank you again so much for this great work and and our hats off to everybody, everybody in the team because this was a really uh, a monumental effort and a team wide effort to make this ha happen. So Kimberly, I think you can see the great appreciation of the board. Uh, for uh, the great work of this clinic. Yeah, again, I mean, as I very much thank Michelle and everybody, it truly was a team and collaborative effort. And it, it really demonstrated the power of everyone coming together and working um, to, to meet a goal. And again, um, you know, we do thank the board for their support, but I, I truly do make feel that the clinic has made a, a truly a, a, a huge difference to, to this community. And it really goes to who we are as a healthcare system, as a healthcare district. And this is how we demonstrate how we are relevant to this community. So thank you. Kimberly, I hope you can convey to everybody that was part of this team, the board's great appreciation. I think that's important that they know how much we we appreciate their work. I, I definitely will do, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate your presentation tonight. You get some rest too, okay? <laughs> still a lot of, still many miles to go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, okay, we're gonna now move on to our next agenda item, which is uh, going to be our quality report with uh, Dr. Halimi and uh, Brenda Brennan. Uh, Kimberly, if you could introduce them. Yeah, uh, this evening, Dr. Halimi is going to be giving the report and really talking about another um, instrumental department uh, to our COVID response and to meeting the needs of our community. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. H uh, Kadir Halimi. He is the medical director of the emergency department here at Washington Hospital Healthcare System. He also serves as section chair in the emergency department, chair for the Department of Medicine, and co-chair for a clinical operations readmissions committee. Dr. Halimi was raised in Fremont, where he graduated from Kennedy High School. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of California, Davis, and attended medical school at the Western University of Health Sciences, College of Osteopathic Medicine in Pomona, California. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at Texas A&M. Dr. Halimi uh, is the founder and president of Orphan House Foundation since 2010, which takes care of orphans in Kabul, Afghanistan. The orphanage was recently ranked number one in Kabul by the European Union. Dr. Halimi has been with Washington Hospital since 2004. Thank you, uh, Kimberly. Thank you, board members. Uh, wow, I didn't know I was here since 2004, just make me made me think that uh, 17 years just flew by. Um, thank you. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure being here and it's a pleasure giving um, this presentation. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to Brenda Brennan who helped me um, with this presentation and of course is uh, my partner in crime, so to speak, uh, at the hospital. Um, 
And next slide, please. So Washington Hospital Emergency Department, um, you know, our mission is to serve the community by providing high quality care, uh, and clinical excellence and efficiency in the emergency department. Um, we were fortunate enough to uh, move into a brand new um, state-of-the-art emergency department, which um, has 39 um, beds that are 100% um, private, uh, which is certainly uh, uh, an improvement from our old nurse department. We had uh, curtains as dividers. We're a stroke receiving center. We're a cardiac receiving center. Uh, special services provided by the hospitals, which include pediatrics, uh, surgery, OBGYN, uh, and internal medicine. We're pediatric ready. Uh, we have crisis teams uh, for behavioral emergencies. We have a very robust SART program. Uh, our emergency physicians are all 100% uh, board certified. Uh, and as um, uh, as noted by our um, recent magnet uh, recertification, which I have no doubt we're going to pass, uh, you know, our, our nurses are um, mostly uh, over 80% bachelors or higher. We have CENs in emergency department, 100% ACLS and PAL certified. Um, that really takes our emergency room and our staff and our nursing really to another level uh, compared to other um, uh, hospitals uh, across the Bay Area and across the nation, I think. Next slide, please. So overall, you know, I, hearing Chris's presentation in the subsequent presentation, overall, um, you know, this year, and I'm talking about calendar year 2021, um, the, the volume has been down, but looking at our overall increase, um, there was an overall increase in patients seen in 2020 compared to 2019. That really was um, a little bit of, um, uh, um, uh, it was really due to the COVID. COVID. Really what happened in 2020, uh, we saw 58,000 patients. But if you look at the numbers and you compare the 2019, your first thing is you say is, oh, we saw more patients. But in fact, what happened in, with COVID was we really um, had to shift gears and open up uh, RSTU, which is your rapid um, uh, screening and treatment unit uh, next to the emergency department, where we put up three tents, which I'll be talking about here, uh, and really um, started doing COVID testing for patients in the um, who needed COVID testing, who were symptomatic, who were uh, exposed, um, and, and a lot of different uh, services that we provided. But mainly outside, we saw a lot of patients there that really um, made our numbers look um, higher, but a lot of that was from the COVID testing. Average uh, of 159 arrivals per day in, in calendar year 2020 compared to 142 in uh, 2019. Again, I'll have some more slides on this to, to show where those numbers are really at and where they came from. April 2020, our main um, ED volume decreased to an average of 69 uh, patients uh, per day. Again, that was really a direct um, um, uh, result of the home stay orders that were there and fear of patients coming to the emergency department. Um, a shift in healthcare towards more telemedicine uh, and urgent care and, and, and find alternative ways of, of seeing patients. We have seen a gradual increase in our visits in, um, since April 2020, but certainly have not returned to the pre-COVID volumes as we had in 2019. Um, as of May 2021, our average number uh, of arrivals was 123 uh, patients per day. Compare that to May of 2019, where we're seeing 148 patients per day. So that's about 25 patients less that we're seeing on average. And if you take that and extrapolate it loosely, that's about 9,300 patients a year that we're seeing less effective for this year. Um, although we're seeing a decrease in number of patients, mainly lower acuity patients, um, our our volume of high uh, of increasingly high acuity patients are increasing dramatically. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of patients delayed their healthcare in 2020 and just did not want to come to the emergency department. They're more concerned about getting COVID, although we were very well equipped to segregate our patients. And now that they're starting to come in, they're coming in to see a lot sicker. I mean, our, our patients are coming in with completed MIs, they're coming in with retro appendicitis. COPD, diabetes, hypertension, you name it, out of control because, again, they've put things off a whole year and now they're starting to come in. Uh, it's our, 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 our percentages, you know, went from 18% uh, percent to, uh, of high equity in 2019 to 21% in 2020. And currently, in, in this uh, first few months of 2021, we're seeing up to 30 to sometimes 44% daily averages of high equity patients. Next slide, please. So three out of four patients seen in calendar year 2020 were seen in the main ED. So uh, what that really tells you that 25% of our patients were seen outside in the RSTU. 
really we're running two parallel merge departments, one on the inside and then one on the outside. And the reason we did that is to really segregate our patients um, who were um, had symptoms for COVID, had exposure to COVID um, from the main population. Although we even segregated further in the department by, by screening every patient that walked into the merge department. So if you look at the two graphs below, one kind of looks at the whole year and one kind of breaks it down by month. On calendar year 2019, we saw about 50, 51,719. And calendar year 2020, we saw 58,000. But if you break that down, 42,000 was seen in the main AD and 15,000 of that was seen outside in the RCU. Now that the RCU is closed, it really shows you what our numbers are now um, in 2021. And again, the graph on the right uh, really breaks that down by a month. And then if you look at March is when really we open up the RCU tents outside and the beige, I don't know what color you guys are seeing, but beige on top is the RCU and the blue is the, uh, the main ED volume. Um, next slide. So emergency department COVID response. So this is really, I, I like to say, this is the, uh, something that we really prepared for. Uh, I can think as far as back as birth flu, uh, Ebola, you know, we had the stimulations and we had protocols in place, but really when COVID hit, we really put all that into test. So it was really our litmus test to, did we do the right things and did we put the plans um, in, um, uh, properly uh, on paper and then really to plan that out. So really everything we had to put in practice. So we really, um, uh, did this to for, for patient and safety for patient and staff safety to minimize transmission of COVID-19 between staff and patients, between uh, patients and family members, and vice versa. Um, you, we universally masked all patients and staff. Uh, we immediately screened and isolated um, any patient that has symptoms of uh, or were high risk patients, either from their nursing home or high risk uh, travel areas. Uh, we did daily education to staff. Uh, we constantly tried to follow national standards uh, for healthcare uh, work safety. We um, maintained consistent uh, uh, supply of PPE. I remember we were in, board, in meetings in this board meeting uh, in the boardroom with Kimberly and her staff seven days a week for two months straight. I remember from 9-11, every single day we were in the, those meetings. Sure, we had PPE, we had proper testing equipment. I mean, I think Kimberly and her staff, I could not say what wonderful job they did to keep us prepared, to keep us in mind, and really came together as a hospital, I think, when, when this hit. Unfortunately, it took a COVID pandemic for us to kind of work so closely together. I mean, I, you know, it was just routine. I got up in the morning at 8.30, I prepared, the meeting was at 9 o'clock, and we were there till 11, just discussed every single issue, and it was really, really helpful, I thought. Uh, it really, really helped us uh, throughout the year. Uh, we had multiple types of um, respiratory protection, which were N95s, P100, the cappers, the halos. I mean, things that other hospitals only dreamed that we had it, and we had it all year long uh, throughout, and we still continue to have it. Um, we had specialized term of cleaning for COVID suspect, uh, suspected patients and patients who were positive in the emergency department as well as upstairs. Um, what really helped us, and, and, I, and you know, I, I want to echo some of the sentiments that were given by everybody to the COVID uh, task, COVID vaccine task force. They did a wonderful job vaccinating the staff as well as the community. And once we got the vaccine, we could really start to see the the, the gas come off the pedal and start the COVID symptoms kind of go down. COVID cases went down. So really want to do give my thanks as well to the uh, vaccination clinic. They did a truly did a tremendous job. Um, you know, we continue to ensure adherence to respiratory hy hygiene, COVID etiquette, and hand hygiene. Because as you know, the COVID, although we've got a good handle on it, it's still not over. We still, um, uh, we still like to practice a lot of those same measures. We have um, safe restriction policies in place, although that's eased up a little bit, but we still like to keep that in mind. Uh, we had elective surgery, mandatory COVID testing. And uh, Washington Hospital was, I think, one of the first, if not the first hospital to mandate that all patients be tested for COVID before they go upstairs. And again, that was really um, a, a wonderful thing that we did for our community and for, for uh, the staff and the physicians as well. So I really, really think that a huge impact on, on how well our patients did and how well we treated them. Next uh, slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so early implementation of the um, ED search response, really, um, as we talked, you know, we had um, our first 
cases of COVID, you know, nationally in December, January, February, we start to really uh, feel the pressure and we opened up uh, our RSTU, those three tents outside in March of 2020. Um, it was really a multidisciplinary uh, effort. It was us in the emergency department. It was lab, it was phlebotomy, it was um, the um, uh, cleaning staff, it was nursing, it was, it was really collaborative, it was administrative. Everybody kind of, we kind of came together again, um, came together to open that up. And we really did it in, I would say, seven or eight days of just kind of planning, putting up tents and getting things going. And that really helped us address um, the need for the community, especially local companies who would have these outbreaks or exposures, law enforcement, city of Fremont, um, EMS, uh, you name it. We were there for them to kind of test them to, to make sure that they were either the exposure um, wasn't getting worse or that it, it, it caught, got caught early. Uh, we also, in May, pivoted to do some swabs for pre-op and uh, pre-op procedures. Uh, we created strategies to uh, pre-schedule appointments in ED through uh, a drive-through process. This really made it um, a um, well-oiled machine. Uh, we uh, accommodated pre-surgical patients from UCSF. Um, in, on top of all that, you know, Betty Goodman, who's our clinical nurse specialist, she spearheaded um, training some of the uh, skilled nursing facility staff to teach them how to swab COVID patients and how to do it correctly and how to um, do um, and, and do competency validation. So she did a wonderful job with her and, and Michael and, and Lisa did a wonderful job training the skilled nursing facility because the need was there. So we, we took it upon ourselves to train our, our local uh, skilled nursing facility staff. The, um, the RCU came to a close in mid-December right after the, the vaccination kind of started, um, but uh, it really truly was a success. And if you look at the graph on the bottom, you know, we started off at 36 minutes, our median time of arrival to discharge from RCU to you to down to 21 minutes. So 21 minutes included you coming in, you getting registered, you're getting vitals, you're getting a vaccine, you're getting uh, 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 all your things done and you're on your way. I mean, 21 minutes, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not much time at all if you think about it, getting that done. You know, so we really were a well-oiled machine. I mean, there's days out there we saw 120, 130 patients and we we're just going through them and, and making sure that nobody was waiting and everybody was accommodated. I mean, we had, um, there was hot days it was, and there was cold days, it rained and it, 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 it didn't snow, but you know, it did everything else. Uh, so it, it really was a, a challenging experience and truly a rewarding experience for, for all of us. And uh, it, it really was a, a service to the community. Next slide, please. So another thing that we looked at in the emergency department is our uh, left foot I've been seeing um, to be, um, our, our goal is really to be below 3%. And if you look at the graph below, we've really um, stayed at uh, below um, 3% throughout uh, 2020 as challenging as it was, and we continue to do so. And the reason for that is because we have dedicated providers in the front of the emergency department, what we call the RTU. We have uh, strategies to immediately room patients and to op open beds. Uh, our charters do a wonderful job um, planning ahead of time um, and making sure that beds are assigned. Um, and we also did a little bit of a, a small test to change where we call patients back what left without being seen during the COVID pandemic. And a lot of them said, you know, they're scared. They thought maybe they changed their mind and they're going to get COVID in the emergency department, which wasn't true. And some of them were scared that they're going to get a bill for these COVID testing. Uh, because a lot of them came in, or not a lot, but some of them would come in for travel testing, which is something we, we didn't do. We did for patients who were sick or exposed, that type of thing. So, but despite all that, we stayed um, below our um, stated goal of 3%. Next slide, please. So patient throughput, um, you know, we, uh, we in the immersive department, we have a lot of different measures that we look at. One of the measures that I like to look at uh, routinely is, uh, you know, patient uh, uh, what time it takes for a patient to arrive to seeing a physician. And our goal is really less than 15 minutes. And if you look at quarter, all the four quarters, we were well below uh, 15 minutes. In quarter 2020, uh, the last quarter, I, I think is when we really had our surge of COVID patients. If you guys all recall, we had 170 COVID patients in house and we had patients in the emergency department in the waiting room. So that really, um, but despite that, we still stayed below our goal. And, and I think we're doing much better this year as well. Looking at patient discharge from the ED, arrival to departure time, CMS call of 178. And if you could look at um, our, our four quarters, we, we remain well below that. And again, that's a testament to working closely and making sure that we um, keep beds ahead of time. We have proper staffing. We have proper MSC uh, provided in the front and do the proper workup. 
Next slide, please. Behavioral health, um, you know, this is a service that really, I, I don't even know if, of any other emergency department in the Bay Area does this. We have a very robust emergency uh, behavioral health program in our emergency department. Uh, I mean, we last, um, I mean, the total number of behavioral patients the last year was 4,814. 97% of those were uh, adults, 3% were pediatric. Um, the pediatric population decreased uh, from 9% to 3% in 2020. And, and, and I pause say that may be due to stay at home order um, that, that was in place. Uh, a lot of kids didn't go to school, so they weren't exposed to a lot of stressors at school with bullying and all that. So a lot of them kind of staying at home. Um, I know my, my, my two sons were much calmer at home than they, when they were when they were coming home from school, but I, I'm just postulating. Um, really, it is a multidisciplinary collaborative um, approach. We have um, continued care coordinators. Again, this is something I don't know of any emergency. I work in a, three other emergency departments um, on, you know, once a month or so, and none of them have what we have as far as a continued care coordinator. We have a psychiatric medical director to take care of 5150s. Uh, 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 placing patients according to the insurance category to this different nursing homes uh, and supporting um, our our whole collaborative is Dr. Villa, who's really there daily seeing patients, helping and, 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 and getting the prog program going. Of course, we have our ED nurses that do ongoing patient assessments, medication administration, and our physicians in ED do all the medical screening, testing to make sure there's nothing medically wrong before we can medically clear them. We've had challenges um, when we, during the pandemic and trying to transfer these patients, a lot of the um, psychiatric facilities required us to have COVID testing. So that put a challenge of doing the test, waiting for results and then getting accepted. Um, that led to prolonged transfer times um, as well as it, pro prolonged transfer times because the facilities were now taking less patients due to, to capacity issues for, from COVID. Um, we also saw a surge in um, increased number of elderly patients requiring um, uh, coordination and placement. A lot of the folks in the past who um, were, you know, would place their loved ones in a nursing home uh, for care were scared to send their loved ones to the nursing home because of COVID. So they would end up sending to the emergency department and we would have to help coordinate, place those patients uh, into a nursing home. So looking at our adult in pediatric uh, uh, length of stays, uh, our internal bench of 5.8 hours were met for adult um, as well as 7.6 hours was for pediatrics. And again, we met both those benchmarks um, as well as um, time disposition of uh, 10 hours for adults and 12 hours for, for pediatric population. Again, we, 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 despite all these challenges, um, due to the good staffing that we have, um, uh, a, um, it, it really was a success. N next slide, please. I'm sure everybody's aware of the Senate Bill 1152 that was introduced in December um, 2018, which mandated us to um, safely discharge all homeless patients. Um, they required us to give them shelter, transportation, clothing, meals, and healthcare referrals. Immediately after the bill, we saw a 4.5 fold increase in our patient volume of homeless uh, patients um, in, in 2019. However, that ho homeless patient population has steadily declined and remains steady in calendar year 2020 as seen by the um, graph below. Next uh, slide, please. Our ED quality and safety initiatives. Um, there's a number of safety initiatives that we have in the emergency department, um, including uh, ED, urinary catheter free. We have slides on that. Um, I've I touched a little bit on the LWSs, uh, quest for zero for sepsis management, behavioral patients, uh, suicide risk management with one-on-one -on -one observation, we certainly have behavioral huddles to coordinate patient care and patients who come in. And if an EMS calls and says, I have a patient on a 5150, a charge nurse, a physician, the, uh, the uh, continued care coordinator will huddle to meet the patient and decide what's the best way to take care of that patient from the beginning. So it minimizes discomfort for the patient, for the staff, for other patients as well. Um, we had COVID response planning. Um, I touched on pandemic planning preparation, patient safety, healthcare um, worker safety, uh, and STEMI. Um, uh, to cath lab simulation. And as you all can imagine, I think Dr. Nicholson can vouch for this. There's a lot of challenges to take patients from the emergency department to the cath lab. Now you add COVID to that scenario. Now we have to test every patient, make sure the tests are back. We got uh, timelines as far as door to balloon time. We got to meet that. We got to meet door to EKG and all these different little challenges. So we had simulations with our colleagues in cath lab to try to 
smoothen the process as much as we can so we can work together and collaborate with them. And I think that was a success as well. We had initiatives for patient experience, our SAR program, and certainly our pediatric readiness project um, and by doing pediatric neonatal mock codes, uh, both up on the floor as well as in the emergency department. Next slide, please. So in uh, participation, uh, you know, having a catheter-free emergency department, it, it, it was it really part of the hospital-wide initiative to decrease um, um, CADI, which is, you know, uh, urinary, um, full, is catheter-associated urinary tract infection. So more than half of the emergency department, uh, more than half, I'm sorry, the admissions come through the emergency department. And a lot of times, decision to place the, uh, the catheter starts in the ED. So uh, avoiding unnecessary, um, uh, uh, we, we did this by avoiding unnecessary placement of urinary catheter to reduce the risk for uh, for uh, uh, for CADI. And certainly, if there's a requirement for a, a Foley catheter, we we didn't hesitate to put one in. For example, obstruction, critical patients, if we needed on you know ICU patients needed to have in their inzo nodes or output input of fluids, we placed uh, Foley when appropriate. But un we we tried our best not to place Foleys and, um, that were not necessary. Um, we did this by having really um, strict uh, criteria for placement. Um, we used uh, external non-invasive catheters, which are also available on the unit. Um, and catheter placed in the ED were checked daily for criteria for uh, criteria for a report that was run. Um, there was also criteria criteria built into charting and epic for appropriate placement to help the nurses make sure they're doing it correctly. Um, and daily tracking and reviewing appropriateness of placement. Um, and then the last thing we did is to put an order in our order set and we put holding orders for patients upstairs to remove the catheter per um, our nursing protocol to facilitate uh, early removal. Next slide, please. So doing all that, we really saw a decreasing in trend of, of, of placement of catheters in the ED and, and as a result, decrease in the cot and cotty uh, throughout the facility. If you look at that graph below, um, there's a downward trend um, where we're down to like 4% um, uh, of number of patients receiving the Foley from the emergency department and really a decrease in number of CADI infections in-house. Next slide, please. So our sexual assault response team, um, Washington Hospital is one of two SAR programs in Alameda County, the other one being Highland Hospital. Um, in calendar year 2020, we saw 58 cases, um, similar to our volumes we saw in 2019. Uh, but certainly a threefold increase since uh, the program was started in 2013. Um, the improvements that we've been we've installed is sexual assault nurse examiners um, have um, a mean response time of less than 30 minutes, which is really important for somebody who comes in for an exam. You don't want it waiting for a long time in, in a room. We've implemented virtual advocacy via iPad. Given the COVID, they couldn't have persons present um, in person, so we we have them present via an iPad. Um, we modified our sexual transmitted infection screening to include syphilis uh, in a response to community outbreak of uh, syphilis, as well as updated our protocols of treatment of um, GC and chlamydia to include uh, higher doses of antibiotics, which are now recommended by the CDC. Um, you know, some of the challenges that we have, um, we're gonna be required to have um, our reports be all done electronically. We're also gonna be required to purchase our own kits where we previously they were supplied to us by um, Highland Hospital. Um, and as you can see on the graph on the right, you know, we provide a, you know, what a 50, 60% of our, our cases in Fremont and Hayward. Uh, you add um, Livermore, that's 73%. And if you also look at Pleasanton and Livermore, that's another 13%. And I think the reason for we get uh, patients from Pleasanton and Livermore is because the hospital, the hats are, I think, Valley, I'm not sure which hospital, their program closed. So as a result, we're catching those patients um, that, to come in our emergency department. So it's a great service, not only for Southern Alameda County, but our neighboring county and as far as away as uh, San Francisco, uh, we get patients. So it's a great program for our community. And I, I think, I don't think we can do without it. Uh, next slide, please. So our domestic violence report and referral, we have a very robust uh, program. Um, Washington Hospital uh, was selected at one of three uh, sites to, to participate in a study done by um, uh, with UC Berkeley to implement electronic domestic violence reporting to increase referrals for advocacy. And this really resulted in an 82% increase in referrals for advocacy. That's a really good number and it's really good. And, and uh, Washington Hospital is recognized as a key participant in the paper published in the, the fall of 2020. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, ED visit trend, you know, nationally JAMA um, uh, published this article that there's been a 33% decrease in ED visits for domestic violence um, after stay at home orders, um, suggesting that, you know, realization of the ED um, has shifted uh, during the pandemic. Um, and I think we've seen kind of similar results, um, a similar trend in, in, our, in our emergency department. And I think uh, in 2021, we so far have 15 cases, which I think our trends are going to go back up. Unfortunately, this is the trend we don't want to see go up. We want it to stay as close to zero as possible. But unfortunately, we're going to we're looking to see uh, probably the same number of patients that we saw in 2019. Um, next slide, please. Our quest for zero. This is a, um, a, a project that we do to uh, minimize uh, uh, liability and harm to our patients. You know, um, we were a recipient of the Beta Healthcare Quest for Zero Award for a 10th consecutive year, which is a great, great accomplishment. We have ongoing participation uh, for enhanced skills, knowledge, and communication. It requires us to complete designated education initiatives. Uh, for fiscal year 2021, we focused on sepsis management. We had 100% completion of our learning modules for sepsis, which included 86 nurses and 25 physicians and APPs. Uh, we participated in a program beta collaborative to improve our timely sepsis care in the emergency department. Um, as a result of that, we implemented a checklist to track compliance uh, of our bundle within an hour of initiation. And we also tried to improve our hand handoff to uh, receiving nurses upstairs to, to continue care that's been started in the emergency department. Uh, for fiscal year 2022, we'll hope to continue our focus on sepsis education improvement. We also want to participate in a program beta collaborative to understand diagnostic errors and strategies to minimize those errors. Uh, and we hope to continue our quest with zero. Patient experience, this was a challenge that was not only unique um, to COVID, but just unique to the times. Uh, you know, with COVID, you know, we couldn't really have visitors come in. And just recently, we were able to allow one patient visitor per, per patient. But really, we could not let anybody in the emergency department. As a result, we had to find other ways and become creative on, on, on communicating with our patients and our family members. Uh, we, we had iPads, we had bed huddles, we did uh, language uh, translation on iPads. Uh, we had standard work for using the iPads. Um, and then also every single patient that had a positive test, a provider would call them. And that continues to fill this day. We let them know that the test is positive, give them advice on how to how to seek care and how to come back for if needed. Uh, and part of that um, uh, was challenging during the RSTU, but we managed uh, with the help uh, of others to kind of get that done. Next slide, please. Our patient experience, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but if you look at overall, our overall emergency department patient experience, uh, we were above uh, a national average, uh, um, there's a, um, uh, a questionnaire that goes up by press gaining to ask the patient randomly as far as their experience in the emergency department on different different aspects. Overall, emergency department patient experience, the Washington Hospital is in blue and Nashville is in the gray. We are above in all categories uh, during the months. Uh, look, looking at likelihood to recommend emergency department, that to me is a really good indicator, right? If you're going to recommend our emergency department to other people, that tells me that you're happy as well. So again, we were above national averages in all our quarters. Doctor concern for comfort. We were above um, all benchmarks in all quarters, as well as emergency department um, nurses kept patients informed about, um, you know, care, COVID testing, family members. Again, that was really important during COVID because it was hard to communicate with them. So putting all those initiatives on the last slide I presented really kept patients and their family members informed, which I thought they did a wonderful job. Next slide. So our next steps, uh, we want to expand our community awareness and engagement. Um, we want to, you know, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times in prior um, presentations, but really want to encourage the community to know that, hey, we, our emergency department is safe. We have 39, 100% isolated uh, beds. We screen from the time you walk in until you're admitted upstairs. Um, really a safe place to get your care, uh, which, um, it's, which really is a testament to Washington Hospital and the Washington Hospital care system because, you know, having this brand new emergency department could not have come at a better time. Uh, we want to participate with EMS to encourage 911 activation for stroke patients uh, and resume in-person advocacy for sexual assault patients. Um, we want to continue to meet um, Washington Hospital ED high standard of quality and patient uh, safety. Uh, we have pediatric readiness, uh, readiness biannual service, completion and plan of focusing on pediatric disaster. 
uh, continue to work on our uh, catheter associated uh, um, UTIs, uh, improve patient uh, throughput. Um, there's another project that Betty Goodman rolling out, which is uh, which is screening for and referring for human trafficking. This is a really wonderful project that's needed. And um, she really is doing a fabulous job rolling this project out. And I think it's going to do a lot of good. Um, participating in program beta risk assessment, which we're going to hopefully uh, learn a lot from. Uh, particip continue to participate in Quest for Zero. Um, and continue to maintain high skill set in education for our nursing staff. We've done education, daily uh, medical minutes. Uh, Dr. Nine, who's one of our ultrasound uh, trained fellows, um, does um, ultrasound guided IVs. We're going to have some of those sessions to learn to put in uh, IVs and difficult uh, to access patients. We're going to continue to strengthen our capabilities to drive uh, future success. Um, ongoing pandemic response and recovery, uh, although I hope we're going towards complete recovery, I got a feeling that this may linger on for next year or two. So we're going to continue to strive to do better and stay on our game. Um, we're going to continue to emphasize our patient experience. Uh, we're going to hopefully pursue trauma center designation um, in the near future and participate in joint commission and um, stroke certification. I know that was a lot and uh, a lot of slides. So um, thank you for your time. I really want to thank um, Kimberly, the staff, um, my nursing staff. I, I cannot do anything. My physicians cannot do anything without our nursing staff. They're wonderful, bar none, the best nursing staff in the Bay Area that I work with. And I work at other hospitals. I'm not just saying that I work at other hospitals and I see we're just, we just have a different culture. We have a different nursing staff and uh, administration than we do at other hospitals. So a big thanks to my nurses and my staff because without them, we're nothing. Uh, and uh, truly proud to uh, work here and bring my family members to get treated here. And it truly is an honor. With that said, I turn it over to you guys for any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Halimi, for the great work over this past year, which I'm sure has been most challenging. I want to open it up for comments and questions from the board. Um, I just, I just want to say when I, when I thought about the uh, dealing with the COVID and, uh, pandemic and all the things that you have taken on and you have to do for the community, uh, I've, I, I, I've just been amazed and that our community is blessed by the fact that we have the. Uh, uh, Morris Hyman Critical Care Pavilion, but that in itself isn't really uh, carry the day. It's uh, it, we're double blessed to have uh, your leadership and the nurses and the staff uh, in our ED uh, dealing with with all that you deal with and do it in such a fantastic manner. So uh, my hat's off to you, Doctor Halimi. You've you've done a great job, and I'm and I'm really happy you're a Fremont guy you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I love coming back and i i, I tell patients i used to come in for asthma attacks when i was in high school in the old ed and to come back and work it's, it's, it's really a dream come true for me so thank you thank you for the opportunity sure <laughs> hey um dr amy i mean um like uh uh you know saying uh it's you know, great work at very stressful times. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you know, now we're talking about post-COVID uh, long haul syndromes and, you know, where uh, multi-organ systems are involved, uh, mental health. Uh, have you started seeing those because they talk about three to six months. Now it's already been three to six months. Uh, have you started seeing some of those cases? So certainly we're starting to see some of that, not a lot of it, but some of it. So our, especially our patients who have COPD and asthma who've been through COVID, we're seeing them come in a little bit sicker. We're seeing them come in um, uh, with uh, bad exacerbations. As far as mental health goes, you know, I, I think COVID was a great stressor for a lot of people, right? Being home, initially, okay, everybody wants to stay home, but being home for three to six months without a job uh, or in having all these meetings on, on Zoom for work, it puts a different type of stress on patients. So we're seeing an uptick in number of, uh, of patients that come in for behavioral uh, complaints, whether that be depression or anxiety. Uh, we definitely have seen that. I've seen an uptick of that. And, and what I've really seen an uptick is just sick patients. And again, I think what I said holds true is a lot of patients put off their medical care for a whole year, right? We have patients who haven't taken their blood pressure medications for, and I'm sure you've seen it in your clinic. 
six months or a year because they just don't want to go see a physician. So we're seeing sicker patients come in and those who had COVID with those comorbidities are having uh, even sicker uh, outbreaks or whatever disease process that they have. So certainly that holds true. Well, I just want to say thank you for the job that you're you're doing thank and you. for being ready for whatever's to come. There's still things that we don't know, but yeah. you you are ready and are striving to continually improve and we really appreciate that. We want the very best for our district and we thank you that that's your heart also. Thank you. Thank I you to your staff. Thank you. Thank you. Bernie, you're muted. Sorry, I think I would learn that after a while. <laughs> it's often said that the emergency department is the face of the hospital. And uh, I've been very reassured tonight, uh, Dr. Halimi, with uh, all that's going on there and all that you're planning. Uh, wonderful, wonderful report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Halimi. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I share the other comments of the board members. I just have two simple questions for you. Well, over this past year, what was your biggest struggle? And of what are you most proud? I guess my biggest struggle was not to burn out. You know, um, you know, being in meetings every single day, seven days a week, and then working, but that doesn't stop, right? So when I did a shift that wasn't when I stopped working, you know, I was there in the morning at nighttime, as you know, everybody had my cell phone number, everybody texted me. So my biggest thing was not to burn out. So I, what really helped me out with that was working out and hiking. I did the trail behind my house that I hiked every single day. I had to have a little half an hour to 45 minutes or else I'd gone insane. So to me, that was the most challenging is not to burn out. What I'm really proud of was how we came together as a team truly to the corny sense of the word, because what happened was when we moved from the old emergency department to the new department, and you know this better than anybody else, in the old emergency department, we were really close. So we were forced to kind of know each other. In the new emergency department, we were really spread out. So in the first year, we couldn't really bond. We couldn't because we were just spread out and it was so big. We had new staff, we had new rooms, we we're trying to find our way, but COVID really forced us to work together. And in doing so, it really brought us closer together. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't tell you how much how much time I spend in emergency department with, with my staff and the physicians and the nursing and the ancillary staff. So it really put us together as a team. And I was proud to know that we can come together and, and really overcome anything, right? I mean, putting those three tents outside and seeing 60, 100, 120, 150 patients a day, is not an easy task. And to do that in 20 minutes per patient. So really proud of, of us coming together and being able to work together and, and not burn out. So it, it, it's been a challenging year, probably the most challenging year that I've had as my career, nothing that I want to repeat ever. Uh, and uh, and we're, we got through it, thank God. You got through it very well, and we're very proud of the great work that the whole emergency room team has done, and we're very happy with your leadership uh, there. So uh, we, we wish you continued good luck and good efforts in, in what you've done. So thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Take care thank and you. Uh, enjoy enjoy the hikes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Okay. Uh, finance report. Chris, you thought you were done, but no. <laughs> no, no. This happens once a year. <laughs> yeah. And after a very difficult year, uh, we've struggled. I think you've got some good news for us, huh? Yeah, um, actually, um, it's nice to have a report I can smile about. <laughs> uh, uh, and hopefully this is portent of things to come. Um, let's move into our operating indicators. Tonight we'll be looking at uh, the hospital's operating and financial results for April uh, 2021. Um, average daily census um, was uh, below budget by five at 140.3. Uh, admissions came in at 771. We'd expected uh, 879. The patient days for the month were 152 below budget at uh, 4,208. 
but our outpatient observation equivalent days uh, were above budget by 73 at 248. The average length of stay for the month uh, continued to be high, and this is based on discharges. So uh, in April, we were still discharging some of our very long lengths of stay. Um, so our average length of stay based on discharges came in at 5.92 uh, versus a budget of 4.96. Looking at utilization, the case mix index, again, this is based on discharges uh, very high at 1.668, and that's reflective of those long lengths of stay that we discharged during the month. Uh, deliveries for the month continue to be lower than expected at 121. Um, surgical cases for the month came in six above budget at 389. Cath lab procedures likewise were, were well above budget at 481. And our outpatient visits for the, for the month were pretty close to budget uh, just a little bit under at 7,397. Uh, emergency room visits, of course, this is excluding RSTU, uh, which closed uh, a number of months ago, um, were 253 below budget at 3,693. Looking at our surgical and cath lab uh, activity, um, really a, a good mix. Um, not only was surgical cases above budget, but the mix was good for us uh, with neurosurgical cases and cardiac surgical cases, both being above budget, joint replacement cases were off by just one and general surgical cases were also off by just one at 194. In the cath lab, uh, really strong performance across the board uh, uh, including our neurointerventional radiology procedures, which were seven higher than budget. Uh, but again, um, that variance of 120 overall spread amongst all of the product lines in the cath lab. Looking at productivity, our um, productive FTEs for the month came in 19 below budget, or excuse me, over budget at 1,278.7. Non-productive FTEs for the month uh, came in at 194.9, giving us total FTEs that were 37 above budget at 1,473.6. But our FTEs per adjusted occupied bed, uh, and again, that's our productivity measure, came in uh, very close to budget at 6.2. So uh, uh, all indications is we had the right levels of staff in the house for the month. And now for the smiles, um, uh, moving into the hospital financials, and this is uh, our go Governmental Accounting Standards Board presentation, which is the presentation we're required to use for our audit. Um, total patient revenue for the month came in almost 7% higher than budget at $183,801,000. Contractuals for the month came in actually a little bit below budget for the month. Had several things going on here. Um, uh, our contractuals for uh, our insured patients uh, came in pretty close to budget at 75.65%. Um, our provision for bad debt and charity um, came in very close to budget, uh, but uh, lower than as a percentage of revenue at 1.84% uh, versus 2.04%. Also in the month, um, April uh, is the start of the fourth quarter of our fiscal year. We start looking back at how we're collecting on the patients uh, or on the accounts that are sitting in AR, making sure our contractuals are appropriately stated. Uh, we did make a, a slight adjustment downwards in our contractuals in the month of about $1.5 million. So that helped out net revenue. Uh, and net revenue did come in um, uh, just under $3 million above budget at $41,732,000. Operating expenses for the month came in $905,000 below budget at $38,669,000. Had a number of things going on here. Our salaries and wages were um, about $450,000 higher than budget with our higher FTEs. Uh, benefits came in $1.2 million below budget, really three drivers going on here. 
Our Blue Shield claims for the month uh, were $115,000 lower than budget. We did have a stop loss recovery on three accounts uh, that uh, amounted to $747,000. Um, and of course our pension, we continue to adjust down uh, as a result of our favorable actuarial report by about 400,000. Supplies for the month uh, came in $303,000 above budget. Um, our prosthesis costs were down for the month, uh, but our stents, AICD's pacemakers, cardio and neuro supplies, uh, PPNE and reagents all offset that um, and were above budget. Um, pro fees and purchase services were $264,000 below budget, and that was driven uh, by lower legal and consulting costs primarily, uh, and then uh, had a lot of smaller variances in multiple areas in that, in that uh, category. So we end the month of April with... Um, uh, a, a nice $3 million um, operating bottom line. Um, uh, we had expected a, a loss of about $819,000 for the month. Non-operating income um, also came in much higher than budget at $1,374,000, um, uh, <laughs> largely driven by a, a, a foundation donation that came to us as a result of the fundraising activities they had done for COVID and a large donation from Fremont Bank that really helped bolster that. So um, our gratitude to the, to the members of the community and to Fremont Bank. Um, uh, we did have a small unrealized gain for the month of 159,000 uh, and so ended up with that non-operating number at 1,374,000 in total bottom line from a GASB perspective of 4.4 million. Take a quick look at our financial accounting standards board. And this presentation is a representation of how the financial markets may adjust our financials when they look at us. Um, first thing we do is reclass $532,000 of revenue bond interest from the non-operating category up into operating expenses. That changes our operating income from a FASB perspective to $2,531,000. Um, after that, we eliminate uh, the tax revenue and expense related to our general obligation bond uh, debt service, uh, and uh, we eliminate that unrealized gain on our uh, investments uh, to end up with non-operating income from a FASB perspective of $1,460,000 and a total bottom line of just under $4 million, $3 million uh, Quick run through our earnings before uh, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, this gives us an idea of how much income the operating and non-operating activities for the hospital generated. Um, first thing we do is we pull uh, depreciation out of our operating expenses, and we end up with an EBITDA of a little bit over $7 million for the month. Uh, we then carve out our um, uh, interest expense from our non-operating category. We end up with non uh, other non-operating income and expense be before interest expense of a little over $3 million. So in total, Washington Hospital's uh, operating and non-operating activities generated $10.1 million for, uh, to provide for debt service, future capital, and funding of new programs. So are there any questions on April? Okay. All right, uh, then I will go ahead and present May of 2021. Um, in terms of the comparison of May of 2020, I just do wanna say that um, as you know, that was when uh, the healthcare system and all the, the hospitals were starting to come out of COVID. So, and a lot of times it, it's probably not, probably not the best comparison. So I, um, we have pulled uh, the 12 month uh, average uh, in many cases for comparison of May, of March, 2019 through February, 2020, which we think is a, is a better comparison. So 
Uh, beginning with the preliminary gross revenue uh, of $170.7 million for May was below budget by $6.6 million, or 3.7%. Looking at the prior 12-month average, um, March 2019 through February 2020, total gross revenue was 181.7. Uh, so the total, the gross revenue for the current month is basically 94% of pre-COVID average. Looking at inpatient gross revenue of 99.6 million was below budget by 10.9 million, or 9.8%. And outpatient gross revenue of 71.1 million was above budget by 4.3 million or 6.4%. In May, we had 22 COVID-19 discharges representing 3% of total discharges. Uh, fiscal year to date, the monthly average of COVID-19 discharges was 69 and represented 9% of total discharges. Um, as uh, Chris also mentioned, um, Given that it is fourth quarter, we are um, looking at year-end reconciliations and, and um, looking at our net patient revenue for May. Uh, it is expected to be $40.5 million, given that um, we were able to um, have some additional reconciliations we took in uh, compared to a budget of $39.4 million. So even though, uh, yes, our, our total gross revenue is off by $3.7 million, Will be we our net patient revenue will be over budget by 2.8 percent uh, higher than budget at 1.1 million. So uh, just wanted to um, make the board aware of that. Moving on to key census statistics, average length of stay of 5.11 was above the budget of 4.85 by uh, 0.26 or 5.4 percent, uh, resulting from the higher acuity of admitted patients. Uh, Outpatient observation days were 129 or 70.5% above budget at 312 days. I think Chris and I were saying that this is probably the highest number of observation days that we have seen. And again, uh, patients are go into observation if they don't uh, necessarily meet the criteria to be um, classified as inpatient to go in as inpatient status. So uh, we had a, a number of this is probably the highest that we've had which also impacted our average daily census of 130.4, which was below budget of 142.8 by 12.4 or 8.7%. So if you're, those patients that were in observation are not counted in the average daily census because those, that um, refers to the inpatient census. Uh, so the average length of stay for the 22 COVID-19 discharges in the month was 7.1 days and one of them stayed longer than 30 days. Of the non-COVID-19 discharges, there were three patients with length of stay, long length of stay, one at 60, one at 37, and one in 31 uh, days. We still do have in-house um, some long length of stay that we are working on placements or that some are not, are not ready for discharge. Uh, we have one patient uh, with a long length of stay of 121 days at this time. But, uh, uh, that patient's not ready for discharge. Moving on to admissions, uh, admissions were below budget by 169 or 18.5%. Admissions for the month were 18 or 2.4% uh, or uh, below May of 2020, but if you look at the 12-month uh, prior average, that was uh, 906, of which 83 were inpatient joint surgeries that have shifted to outpatient. So when you take that into account, uh, comparing to that 12-month average, uh, it was 823 compared to what we had still below that of 744. Looking at patient days, um, admissions were below budget and length of stay was higher than budget, resulting in patient days of 4,042 that were below the budget by 8.7% or 385. Our surgical trend, um, you'll see that we uh, have a number of our uh, physicians that are have been taking some time, starting to take some time off as I think we'll see that also coming into the summer months. Um, as we all know, it's been a long time since people have had a break. And so, um, and we'll see some of that impact. Uh, total surgeries in May of 343 were below budget by 38 or 10%. The prior 12-month average was 386. In, inpatient surgeries were 64, or 35% below budget at 119. 
The, the 12 month prior average was 231, of which 83 were joint uh, surgeries. Uh, so excluding those, uh, the average was 148. Outpatient surgeries were 26, or 13.1% above the budget at 224. The prior 12 month average was 156. Uh, looking at the surgical activity broken down, our general surgical procedures were below budget by 14 or 7.9%. Uh, the prior 12 month average was 195. Uh, joint replacement surgeries were below budget by 26, 15.4% uh, at 143. Uh, the prior 12 month average was 151. Our neurosurgical procedures were below budget by three or 12% at uh, 22. The prior 12 month average was 25. And cardiac surgical procedures, we had uh, a busy month again, were above budget by five or 55.6% at 14. And the prior 12 month average was 10. Um, as, as I mentioned, uh, we did have uh, two of our orthopedic doctors, Dr. Christoris and Dr. Dearborn had taken time off uh, during the month of May. Moving on to the cath lab trend, uh, cath lab procedures for May of 298 were 85 or 22% uh, below budget. The prior 12 month average was 400. Uh, looking at the cath then in cases for May was 178 um, uh, and comparing that to the prior 12 month average was 202. Inpatient cath lab procedures were below budget by 74 or 33.9% at 144, and the 12 month average was 230. Outpatient cath lab uh, procedures were below budget by 11 or 6.7% 6 at 154, and the 12 uh, month uh, average uh, was 170. Uh, looking at it broken down by cath lab activity, our cardiac procedures were below budget by eight at 125, and the prior 12 month average was 140. Our peripheral vascular procedures were below budget by 68 at 103, and the prior 12 month average was 169. The non vascular interventional radiology procedures were below budget at 60, uh, below budget by seven or 9.7 percent at 65 and the prior 12 month average was 84. Our neurointerventional radiology procedures were below budget by two or 28.6% at five, and the 12 month average was seven. And similar to the operating room we do, uh, we had a couple of our physicians that were out, and one of our busiest, Dr. Bruce Lynn, was, has been out um, for some time with some family issues. Moving on to deliveries. Um, Deliveries for May of 119 were below budget by 12 or 9.2 percent. So we're continuing to to sort of see some of the deliveries come back, but not to where we had budgeted. Um, and as we've talked about in the past, we're continuing to see the impact of the pandemic on on deliveries. Looking at our non-ER outpatient trend, our non-emergency outpatient visits of 7,464 were below budget by 205 visits, or 2.7%. Uh, the prior 12-month average uh, was 7,958. Uh, the visits for the current month are 94% of pre-COVID-19 average. And really, this uh, we have below budget uh, visits by the, in x-ray and in lab. Uh, looking at our emergency room uh, visits, our emergency room visits of 3,812 were below budget by 362 or 8.7%. Uh, looking at the 12 month average was uh, 4,490. So again, as we've talked about in, in a number of the presentations this evening, it's about 85% of uh, key of uh, pre-COVID levels. We see it coming up some, but still not to where we were um, prior to COVID. So going to our gross revenue recap, our emergency visits were below budget by 362 or 8.7%. Um, and RSTU closed earlier, as you know, in the year in December, driving emergency room revenue down by 2 million or 17.1%. Our cath lab procedures were below budget by 85 or 22.2%, partially offset by a favorable procedure mix driving cath lab revenue 
down by 2 million or 14.5%. Total surgeries were lower than budget by 38 or 10%, but there were more cardiac procedures driving surgical services revenue down by 1.4 million or 4.1%. Uh, pa patient days were below budget by 385, 8.7%, but patient acuity was higher, resulting in room and board revenue down uh, only 1 million or 3%. Uh, deliveries were below budget by 12 or 9.2%, uh, driving birthing revenue center revenue down by 538,000 or 15.8%. Uh, also, that was driven by uh, less C-sections that we did this past month. Outpatient activity drove ancillary services revenue slightly above budget by 416,000 or 0.5%. Uh, moving on to our Payer mix, uh, or government-sponsored uh, patient revenue, made up 71.4% of total gross revenue. This is higher than the budget by 0.1% and higher than the prior year by 0.7%. And as you can see, there was a shift from Medicare to Medi-Cal. HMO was 4.1% of gross revenue, which is above the budget of 2.6% and higher than the prior year of 3% of gross revenue. Uh, we had three high-dollar HMO accounts totaling uh, about $1.7 million, which is really driving this, this increase. Our PPO was 23.4% of gross revenue, which is below the budget of 24.1% uh, and lower than the prior year of 24.6%. And private pay was 1.1% of gross revenue, which is below the budget of 2% and lower than the prior year of 1.7% of gross revenue. Looking at our productivity indicators, our productive FTEs were above budget uh, by 4.6 or 0.4 percent at 1,279.9, and our non-productive FTEs were above budget by 1.4 or 0.9 percent at 149.7. It gives us our total FTEs of 1,429.6, which were above budget by 6 or 0.4 percent. Uh, our total FT, our productive FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 5.73 were higher than the budget of 5.56 by 3.1%, and total FTEs per adjusted occupied bed of 6.40 were higher than the budget of 6.21 or 3.1%. So we still have some work to do on the productivity. Uh, looking at our outpatient assistance statistics, uh, a witness clinic visits were below budget in May by 1,726 or 9.9% at 15,738. Um, a great deal, a large percentage of this um, is due to providers being off and also due to some budgeted uh, for new uh, physician positions that haven't yet uh, started. Our development corporation visits of 2,559 were below budget by 801 at 23.8% for the month of May. Um, looking at Washington Urgent Care, it is down 595. As you know, we are winding down uh, Washington Urgent Care and it will be closing at the end of June. Uh, our Washington Outpatient Rehab Center uh, was also down 189. We do have uh, an open therapist position that we are in the process of, of recruiting for. Our Ohlone Student Health Center uh, is has not yet, uh, it is working on being opening um, for the next uh, semester uh, with Ohlone that in the fall that they are going to be going to hybrid, so it will be opening and we will be seeing visits uh, on site at that point. And then uh, it's offset by our outpatient surgery center being above budget by nine visits and our radiation oncology center that has been busy with uh, 51 additional visits. Uh, moving on uh, to our key financial statistics. Um, our days cash on hand for May ended at 162 days, an increase of six days from last month. This is primarily due to an increase in patient collections of four days and also along with uh, donations from the foundation. Uh, in June, we do expect some federal supplemental payments that will be coming in, um, uh, 797000 from AB 113 and another 771000 from Prime. 
Um, so, but we do know that, I do want to note that in July, and we'll say this again, uh, we will, the, re the revenue bond debt service of 13 million will need to be paid in July, and that represents about 11 days. And da uh, days of gross revenue and accounts receivable were at 65. Uh, there were $332,059 in charity care applications pending or approved in May. Uh, so those are the key financial statistics for May 2021. Are there any questions? Kimberly, any questions from the board? Okay. Uh, Kimberly, do you have announcements? I do have just a couple of quick announcements. I do want to begin by uh, stating our employee of the month for June 2011. It's Nikita Patel. She is a staff nurse, too, on Five West. Um, when Five West was announced as the floor designated to treat COVID-19 patients, Nikita Patel was nervous. It was a frightening time with new information on a daily basis, but Nikita and her coworkers were confident their safety was a priority. She says, our leadership team was very supportive, providing PPE, implementing safety measures, and providing extra staff when our patients needed it. The bonds of those working on Five West became stronger than ever. Nikita feels that her team can get through anything as long as they have each other. Originally from India, Nikita moved to Toronto during high school and received her nursing degree there. When she was looking into her career in the medical field, Nikita realized that nursing offered the most patient contact and the most opportunity to get to know the patients. The better you know the patients, the better you can help them, she says. In 2016, Nikita finished the new grad program at Washington Hospital and knew this was her place. She worked in several different departments and always found the staff friendly and helpful. In addition to nursing excellence, Nikita learned the patient first ethic. Her coworkers note that Nikita is always willing to help no matter if she's just starting or just finishing her shift. According to her nurse manager, Gurinder Kaley, Nikita is a favorite of patients. They often comment on her caring personality. Coworkers refer to Nikita as the ultimate team player. She is de a dependable colleague with a shining personality. Congratulations, Nikita Patel. And then just uh, to move on to a few announcements in terms of just talking a little bit about some of our uh, educational uh, events that happened. Um, on Thursday, May 13th, Washington hosted Celebration of Life via Zoom. This event featured stories of survival and hope for cancer survivors and their families. The event was co-sponsored by Washington Hospital, HERS Breast Cancer Foundation, the UCSF Washington Cancer Center, the American Cancer Society, and Tri-City Voice. We had 37 of the community members that virtually attended. On Tuesday, May 25th, as part of the Speakers Bureau program, Lucy Hernandez, Community Outreach Manager, presented the 2020 Community Health Needs Assessment to the Promotoros de Salud of Newark. The Promotoras de Salud, also known as the Promotoras, are health advocates who work in Spanish-speaking communities. 29 community members attended virtually by Zoom. On Tuesday, May 25th and Wednesday, May 26th, uh, Washington Township Medical Foundation coordinated and staffed the vaccine clinics, as we heard from uh, Michelle at Newark Junior High School and Newark Memorial High School, and more than 300 community members were vaccinated. And just in terms of a couple of our out upcoming uh, outreach events, on Wednesday, June 16th at 3.30, Sherry uh, Harrington, a register, registered respiratory care practitioner, will present Breathe Easier with Pulmonary Rehab. On Thursday, June 17th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m., as part of the Women Empowering Women Support Group, Dr. Victoria Leapart will present Everybody is Beautiful. And uh, finally, on Wednesday, June 30th, at 3.30 p.m., Anna Mazai, a registered dietitian, will provide a fresh, a fun, fresh summer cooking demonstration on Facebook Live and YouTube. So those are some of our upcoming events that I wanted to let the board uh, know about and the community. That is all that I have in terms of announcements. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. And I just wanted to say Nikita Patel is a great nurse. I'm just good choice. Glad to have her. Yeah. Very much. I agree with you. Yeah. So are there any questions?
questions or concerns that the board members would like to share at this time? If not, uh, it's been a good meeting and a lot of good information. Glad we got the budget passed and I look forward to a, a great year ahead. So uh, there being no further business before this board, this meeting is adjourned.